How's this? Daiki asked, standing back to admire his handiwork. Eh, it's decent I suppose, but not really to my liking, Isobu replied half-heartedly. What's wrong with it? Daiki gestured to the pond he was standing before. He cleaned it all up, got rid of any nasty crap laying around in it and even replaced all the stones and stuff in it with nice shiny new ones. Literally, he fucking sanded them down to make them smooth and glossy because he couldn't find anywhere place that sold crap like that. He really needed to learn more earth jutsu. As it was, he was forced to use the coral palm jutsu to create some coral structures and the light to spread throughout the pond. Not to mention the literal structure he'd created for a mini waterfall, now that was a pain in the ass, he'd had to send clones to the library and have them search for hours to find out how to do that. He'd put a lot of work into this damn pond, there's not enough vegetation in it, I like some moss in my water at the bottom, and while the coral structures are nice, I prefer ones with openings at the bottom I can get beneath and relax out of sight, Isobu rattled off, also, I'd like some rocks that are easy to get atop that stick up out of the water like small platforms so I can come up and enjoy the sun as well sometimes. You've thought about this a lot, Daiki deadpanned. You're not one to talk, Isobu snorted back, your training would be going so much better right now, if not for the fact that the extra clones you've been able to make since we got fully started, have all been used to study house repair guides and manuals and creating the perfect, bachelor pad, as you like to call it. Daiki winced, he had no comeback for that. He was up to having 30 clones out at all times a day now. The same amount were still being used for training though, while the new extra 9 clones running around, were all assigned to maintenance on his new place. Alright, alright, I'll give it a tune-up, Daiki relented. It wasn't like he'd filled it with water yet anyway. Any preferences for wildlife? People won't pay as much attention if there's a bunch of other critters in there with you. Get some koi I suppose, they draw the eye a lot. Maybe add a few lily pads and some frogs I suppose, Isobu mused, by the way, that girl is still hanging around outside the property. I know, Daiki nodded, it just wasn't an issue, she wasn't exactly causing any harm. Nearly two weeks had passed since he returned from his mission to the village of artisans, built within the land of loot, sorry land of rivers. He hadn't saw Sasuke much of all since he dropped the big news bomb on him, the older boy had collected the money Daiki owed him for the new place and they'd sparred twice, but the boy was in an odd state between focused and distracted, it was weird. He'd actually saw Hinata more than Sasuke, she popped up at training ground 69 every few days to spar with him, and Daiki definitely wasn't go to turn her away. The experience of fighting a gentle fist user, was not only helpful for his own fighting experience, but learning from her movements as well. If he really needed to, Daiki was sure he could copy some of the gentle fist and close tenketsu. It wouldn't be viable really mid-fight, because the taijutsu style didn't mesh well with his way of fighting, but it could definitely help for capturing people if needed and keeping them docile. Plus, watching her stellar rack bounce around with like every movement she made was a treasure for the eyes for sure. A week ago though, he'd noticed something. Hinata had a little follower who followed him to his training ground, and now to his new house. It was a girl too, who was, spying, on him. Adorable little Hanabi Hayuga. I suppose I'll fill it up for now, Daiki mused, putting the little girl out of mind for the moment. What Isobu wanted added, could be done later once it was full, he'd leave a clone to it. Focusing his chakra, Daiki brought bot hands into a seal and spread his energy out into the air around him, hidden mist jutsu, he said. His chakra threaded through the moisture in the air and moments later, a thick, blinding mist spread throughout the property, it was so thick and full of chakra that without focusing chakra into his eyes, he couldn't see more than a few feet in front of himself. Grunting, Daiki focused on the chakra-filled mist, before using his chakra to draw it all together. The mist cleared up in moments, coming together and forming into a large sphere of water, hovering over Daiki's head. He flicked his fingers down, and the water sphere formed into a stream and poured into the pool, filling it up. Daiki whistled, damn, has to be a good few thousands gallons in there, he noted, impressed with himself. It had taken a ton of chakra, but he put the training in water elemental manipulation his clones had been going hard at, to good use. Yes, this'll do, the water is much more pure and clean than normal thanks to your chakra. Isobu noted, pleased. Good, good. Daiki nodded, before bringing his hand to his neck and cracking it, suppose I'll deal with my little admirer now as well. He mused. While he didn't mind her watching him for the most part. 
It would be kind of hypocritical of him to do so considering he could peek into the hot springs on the other side of the village from his living room with his eyes and had done so a few times, totally accidentally of course. But yeah, while she was watching him, he couldn't really go about his more, clandestine training. Quickly, Daiki made a clone and switched places with it a split moment later, too fast for a little girl like herself to keep up with for sure. He hid his chakra completely using his eyes, before dipping around the building and moments later, silently landing behind his target, leaning against the outer west wall of his property, veins visible around her eyes and peering straight through the wall. Hmm, odd. Her hair was cut pretty short, framing her face. He was sure that only happened after the time skip and it was long during the Chunin exam finals. Then again, it was just a hairstyle change, so not really worth focusing on. Getting a good look, he spoke up, crossing his arms and eyeing the girl in amusement. Hanabi gave a startled jump, before whirling around, by Kugan blazing and falling into the gentle fist-opening stance on instinct. You, she glared. Me, Daiki agreed with a nod, he was himself of course after all. Very well, since it's come to this, I'll just have to defeat you, the little Hayuga declared, grandly. Okay, Daiki replied lamely, raising an eyebrow at her. Feel the might of the Hayuga clan, Hanabi shouted before lunging at him, two fingers out on each hand and filled with chakra. She launched into a barrage of blinding finger strikes, aiming for his tenketsu and he had to admit, she was pretty damn fast for her age. Faster than he was when he became a genin actually. Not fast enough though. Without even uncrossing his arms, he dodged and weaved between her rapid fire finger strikes, stepping back every now and then for some space. Finally, he just got bored of that though, and lashed out with both hands, grasping her wrists and yoinking her up into the air. So, why are you spying on me little Hayuga? Daiki asked. You'll never make me talk, she snarled, like a cute little puppy. Haya, she lashed out with a strong kick at his unprotected side. A dull thump echoed as her kick made impact, and Daiki just stared at her. No really, why are you spying on me? He repeated his question. My strongest kick had no effect? Hanabi went wide-eyed in shock. Well, his ribs throbbed a tiny bit from it, but he took harder hits from his clones, multiple dozens of times a day, so it was easy to ignore. You're pretty good for your age Hanabi, Daiki chuckled, really good actually, but I'm the best genin in this village, so you'll need to get a lot stronger if you want to beat me. Neji is the strongest genin in the village. She glared cutely at him before blinking her pupil-less eyes slowly and then going wide-eyed in shock. Wait, how do you know my name? She demanded. You're Hinata's little sister, she talked about you sometimes, Daiki shrugged, not actually lying. Hinata did mention her sister during small talk after they sparred, and no, Neji is the second strongest genin in the village, maybe third actually depending on how a few others go about fighting, I'm the definite strongest, but you already know a bit about how strong I am with how much you've been spying on me the past few days, right? So you knew, she gasped, hear you trying to lull me into a false sense of security then and ambush me like you have here? No, I just didn't really care you were spying on me, Daiki shrugged, if I had to guess, this has something to do with Hinata's new attitude. Fine, yes it does, she growled cutely, sister has changed greatly in the last few months and I have deduced that it is because of you. Pretty much, Daiki nodded, not denying his involvement, what's the problem? Hanada getting more confident and using her strength properly was a good thing, wasn't it? Hanabi stopped glaring at him, and a lost look appeared on her face. I do not understand, sister is weak, she cannot even beat me, she said, even with her new attitude, she has still lost to me, yet she, her new confidence remains, and when I followed to to find out why, I saw her fighting you, she was much stronger than she was against me and much more ferocious. Damn right that girl was ferocious. Seriously, it didn't matter how many times he put her on that nicely plump and shapely round ass of hers, she bounced right back up and came right at him like a lioness fighting for her next meal. But, Daiki could understand the girl's confusion. He remembered vaguely that Hanabi always looked up to her sister, but the weakness in Hinata, slowly squashed that as she was promoted to heiress over her and claimed to be her better in every regard by her father and grandfather. It wasn't until after she saw Hinata's resolve, a newly created powerful jutsu of her own and Hinata facing off against pain to save Naruto, that Hanabi realized, her sister had always been strong. It's because she's kind, Daiki answered simply, you're her precious little sister after all. Hanabi's eyes slowly widened in realization at his words, but, but it is Hinata's fate to be weak, 
she whispered, and it looked almost as if the little girl's entire world had been turned upside down. Like she couldn't understand at all, why Hinata was strong now. It was her fate to be weak, Daiki stated firmly, he didn't deny that. The canon Hinata, was pathetically weak. The thing about fate little firecracker, is that there isn't just one path and a single decision can send you down an entirely new road. All I did, was give her a little push down a different road than she was traveling before. There was no use denying it really, for one, some kind of destiny shit did exist in this world, it might not be absolute, because he knew for sure he could go kill Naruto right this very moment and the prophecy about him uniting the biju would never come to pass. Not that it would actually anyway, because Isobro was with him now, and he didn't plan on letting anybody rip out his bro and stuff him in a nasty ass looking statue. How many times are you going to keep calling me that? Isobu griped. Plus, convincing someone like Neji or even Hanabi here that fate wasn't actually a thing, would require a bunch of speeches and some fighting against unwinnable odds and stuff. So, the best thing to do, was just take his own spin on things. Just because fate was already written in the stars, didn't mean he could take a rubber to it and replace it with a different tale. Multiple paths, Hanabi mumbled, so, it's not just my fate to lead the Hyuga clan? Daiki lowered the girl to the ground gently and shrugged, if you want it to be, you can run right down that road, he told her, but if you want to go a different path, you can do that too. You can do anything you want if you're strong enough. So fate can be changed if you have enough strength, I see. Hanabi nodded slowly, understanding dawning on her. Right, now for the big finish. If you're not strong enough, all you have to do is throw yourself fully into the grind until you are strong enough, Daiki confirmed, when you are, you can accomplish anything you put your mind to. He added, and thrust his right palm up, channeling chakra through his hand. The air rumbled and distorted as he unleashed a powerful shock wave with the force palm jutsu, followed by a second, third and then more in rapid succession. That, that's, Hanabi gaped wide eye at him. The 8 trigrams vacuum palm. You can use one of our clan's most advanced techniques and in rapid succession. Daiki paused and blinked, huh, it is quite like that, isn't it? He mused, before shaking his head, it's not your clan's technique though, I created this technique of mine not long after I became a genin, in fact it was the first technique I created, pretty cool huh, he bragged proudly. I see, I understand now why you claim to be the strongest genin, not even Neji can use this technique yet, Hanabi said slowly, gazing at him almost in awe, Hinata ne sama followed your teachings, and has become much stronger for it so strong that even throwing fights against me in front of the entire clan, has no effect on her confidence. Well, kind of, more or less, Daiki shrugged, your sister has always been strong and beautiful, she just needed someone to teach her how to use what she had better. Hanabi furrowed her brows at his words, then, can you teach me how to use what I have better, she asked. Daiki froze, he wasn't exactly against it, it would cut into some of his time, but teaching in of itself might be a good new way to progress himself in the grind. Also, Naruto had his own mini-me disciple squad. Konohamaru legit took on and beat one of Pain's paths, full-on clan head John and weren't even capable of that. Maybe, the Tan Genin replied, the question is, what exactly do you want to accomplish? Like, what do you want me to help you with? That was kind of important, right? I don't know, Hanabi shrugged. I like to train and I like getting stronger, is that not enough? No dream, huh? No, that's perfectly fine motivation, Daiki totally approved, that his literal reason for the grind as well, he liked getting stronger, granted, there was the tidbit about stopping the apocalypse and all, but he didn't exactly have a, dream, or overall super, goal, like Naruto or shit, if you want me to train you, that's fine, I'm all for it. Ah, Hanabi blinked, before smiling ever so cutely, and bowing politely to him, then I'll be in your care Daiki sensei. Daiki sensei? That just sounds wrong somehow, Daiki shuddered, call me Aniki instead, he said, before reaching over to pet her gently on the head. Okay, Aniki. Hanabi nodded vigorously. Ah, she was so cute. Hanabi yelped as his hand moved to her shoulder and he bodily picked her up and hung her over his own shoulder. What are you doing Aniki? she asked. Let's go get some food and we can talk about what way you want me to train you, he replied with a grin, what's your favorite food? M, okay. Hanabi wrapped her arms around his neck and hung on as he began walking. I'm partial to the bananas and milk, and I absolutely disdain Mitsuba. Milk and bananas, huh? As expected of a Hyuga. Even while eating, she was cultivating her bloodline. Right, 
First things first, Daiki declared an hour later after filling his belly and getting a good rundown of his new student's thoughts on her abilities. Before we get down to the training, I need to show off a bit to you. What do you mean Aniki? Hanabi, once again hanging over his shoulder asked, confused, isn't showing off a silly thing to do for a shinobi? Father always said that the ones that need to show boat about their strength, do it for validation to feel good about themselves because they have no true belief in their own abilities. That did sound like Hiyashi Hayuga, that was for sure. In a way, he's not wrong, Daiki nodded in agreement, but this isn't about me showing off to make myself seem cool and stuff, it's about showing you a bit of how strong I am. He explained, walking along the paths between the training grounds. He was not headed towards training ground 69 for now though, he had something else to take care of, another destination that would allow him to kill multiple IWA shinobi with one jutsu as the saying went. Damn rock humpers. What do you mean? Hanabi repeated her question. I don't understand the point of you showing off your strength for me. It's about trust, he stated simply, so you can see proof and have faith in me, like, if anything or anyone super strong popped up, you wouldn't need to be afraid cuz, you know I'd kick their asses and make them my little bitch. You're very crass Aniki, Hanabi noted, but nodded in understanding, but yes, I understand now, thank for you explaining. Not a problem, if you've got something you don't understand, just ask me, I'll do my best to help you out, he flashed her a thumbs up, just make sure you don't let go of me, the place we're going is a little bit dangerous. I will not, Hanabi promised. Their destination, was training ground 44, or, using its other name, the forest of death. He needed to test out the summoning contract he'd been working on for Isobu. Training Ground 44, was the best place to do so, it was filled with massive, powerful beasts after all. Underscore, the forest of death in total, was around 10 kilometers long. That totaled out to just over 6 miles. With the Shinkugan, at a high enough vantage point, Daiki could easily oversee the entirety of the forest. So as he approached the massive gates barring off the training ground, he picked the perfect spot. He launched himself up through the air with a powerful leap. Hanabi secured on his back with her grip around his shoulders and landed atop a branch sticking out of a gargantuan tree over a thousand feet tall. The second he landed, an ominously loud chittering resounded through the air and a massive centipede over a hundred feet long and thicker than he was tall launched up towards them. Pincered mouth aimed directly at him to bite him in half. Aniki. Hanabi's arms tightened around his neck and she froze at the sight of the massive beast. Don't worry, he assured her calmly, and thrust out one hand, channeling a hefty dose of chakra through the seal on his palm, forced palm jutsu. The air rippled and distorted as a massive shockwave erupted from his palm and slammed straight into the massive insect's face just as it was a few feet away. Its huge, ugly face erupted in a shower of gore, slimy green blood and innards raining through the air while its corpse topped backwards to slam into the ground below. Daiki easily avoided the nasty green goo, hopping up onto a higher tree branch. See? He grinned at Hanabi. The creatures in this forest are pretty big, but any decently strong genin can handle them one on one, he assured. Hanabi blinked, I see, true, it was not faster than me. I could have dodged it if needed, she agreed, though, I lack the striking power that would have been needed to break through such an insect's tough shell. Your jutsu ignored its outer shell entirely for the most part and struck it from the inside. Shockwaves are pretty nifty for that, good catch, Daiki praised the girl, gotta inspire confidence in his student after all, if blunt force and slashing attacks aren't working, shockwave types like your Hyuga vacuum palm and my force palm are great backups. Understood, Hanabi nodded, so then, do you recommend I work on the 8 trigrams vacuum palm over the 8 trigrams 64 palms? You know, your techniques are a mouthful, Daiki noted with a snort. Hopping off the tree branch to another and making his way through the forest, idly scanning the place with his eyes, looking for a nice target, it's up to your preference in the end, you can already block Tenketsu, the 64 palms is pretty good, but it's just a faster more advanced version of what you can already do. The vacuum palm gives you a long range option with some good variety usage and can do damage to tougher opponents that your 64 palms can't. Hum, Hanabi hummed, your points are valid, the problem is, the vacuum palm while easier, costs a lot more chakra to use, so is usually put off longer until we Hyuga develop larger chakra capacities. Gotcha, Daiki nodded and understand, that's something I can help you with definitely, I'm a bit of an expert on increasing chakra capacities actually, but enough about that, do you have a favorite type of animal? 
Not especially, though I suppose I'm fond of cats to a degree, she replied. Cats, all right, that'll work, Daiki grinned, he'd already caught sight of a few. Next question then, lion or tiger? I'm more partial to a tiger, Hanabi answered, why are you asking me this? Cause I'm gonna test something out, he replied, if it works out, I'll get you a summon of your own. It wouldn't exactly be a famous summon clan or anything, but it would be useful, especially due to what he found in the contract matrix for the chameleon clan. Are summons not rather rare? Hanabi asked, confused, perhaps a little befuddled. Yeah, but they're pretty amazing, totally worth getting, I have a contract with the chameleons, they're awesome. Daiki happily told her, besides, this will be your own personal summon. After all, if it worked, he couldn't just dump it or something, so he'd give it to his new student. That, is a very big tiger. Hanabi noted, it didn't take them very long to find their prey. With his eyes, just sweeping glances over the area would let him see through practically every part of the forest. The sensory input was a bit hard to handle and caused a headache, but Isobu's chakra easily handled any inflammation that appeared in the brain from overworking it like this. As amazing as the Shinkugan was, it wasn't something that could be used so leisurely, it had its own drawbacks. Well, unless you had a biju, then you could just laugh in the face of such a thing and dab all over it. God he loved being a jinchuriki. Have I mentioned how odd of a human you are? Isobu added. Yes, yes he had, multiple times. Putting that out of thought for now, Daiki looked down at their target. It was a massive, massive tiger. He estimated it to stand around 70 feet high on all fours, and had a proud burnt orange set of fur that stood out against the backdrop of the forest. The huge beast was currently laying under a pile of rocks fashioned together in crude cave shelter. Its own making perhaps? Daiki mused. Animals in general in this world were much smarter than the ones from his other life due to possessing chakra. The summoning contract on top of that not only bound the signers together through blood and chakra itself, it also stimulated the chakra itself of the summoned beasts, which allowed for them to gain much higher mental faculties, that rivaled or even surpassed humans due to the mental aspect of the chakra. That was the reason why the contract itself, was so much harder to create than just a, simple, summoning seal, and why he was out here in the first place to test out the blank contract he'd made. Alright, now that we've found it, I'll let you get a see for how useful summons are okay, Daiki grinned at Hanabi. By all means, Hanabi nodded, I am quite curious to see your summons now. Well, make sure you don't pee yourself in fright, Daiki teased, before biting his thumb and then quickly running through hand seals, summoning jutsu, he slammed his hand down. There was a massive puff of smoke, and then from it, the titanic form of Shiramari appeared, the huge tiger leapt to its feet at the boss summon's appearance and snarled at him. It didn't have much effect though, considering it didn't even reach the end of the chameleon's leg in height. Daiki had to give it to the tiger though, it didn't back down even with the massive size difference. Hell, Shiramari was comparable in size to Isobu. With a roar that would probably make a civilian curl up and die on the spot from a heart attack of pure fear, the huge tiger leapt at Shiramari, fangs and claws bared. Just before it made contact though, a humongous serpent-headed tail whipped out blindingly fast and wrapped around the tiger's neck, stopping it in its tracks and lifting it into the air. It thrashed and clawed at the air wildly, but the sheer difference in size and strength couldn't be overcome so easily. Daiki, Shiramari nodded down at him respectfully, I do not sense any powerful enemies in the area, why have you summoned me? Nothing like that buddy, Daiki grinned and waved at the girl on his shoulder. This is Hanabi, my new apprentice, I just wanted to show her how amazing summons can be. I see, very well, Shiramari nodded simply, what of this tiger, shall I kill it? Nah, I needed to test something out, Daiki waved the huge chameleon off, and if it works out well I'm gonna make this guy Hanabi's personal summon beast. Ah, the summoning contract for your turtle friend, understood, Shiramari nodded in understanding, before looking down at Hanabi with great big yellow eyes. A pleasure, student of the chameleon clan summoner. Perhaps you will one day sign our contract as well? He mused lightly, before dipping his head, and then erupting into a puff of smoke and disappeared. The huge tiger, half unconscious from being choked out by Shiramari's huge tail, hit the ground, falling from a good 50 feet in the air, the impact of its huge bulk making the ground shake. So, what did you think? Daiki prompted the girl on his shoulder. Hanabi stared at the spot Shiramari towered over a moment ago, before swallowing, I understand, 
summons indeed seem very powerful, I do not even know how I would begin to combat such a powerful beast, she answered, awe coloring her tone, before she directed her gaze down at the huge tiger that was slowly pushing itself to its feet, in contrast, the tiger does not seem nearly as impressive. That's mostly because while it's sentient, it lacks sapience, the wisdom uses its sentience and intelligence, Daiki laughed lightly, the summoning contract, if it works, will bind to its chakra and its bloodlines, bestowing that sapience on it, which basically means, it'll be smarter and even able to train and develop special abilities like jutsu maybe, everyone has to start somewhere after all, besides, most genin would get thrashed by this guy here, it is female actually, Hanabi corrected him, huh, well, get thrashed by her then, he amended, then nodded, alright, let's do this then, he hopped off the tree, landing in front of the tiger just as she rose up to her full height, shaking off the daze from being choked out by his chameleon buddy. She locked eyes with Daiki, before snarling, none of that now. He glared right back at it, drawing upon Isogu's chakra, just enough so a yellow ring formed around his dujutsu and his eye whites bled into inky ring purple. And he unleashed the combined killing intent of himself and Isobu. The giant tiger froze abruptly, its legs trembling beneath it and locking it in place. He had to give it props again for not just collapsing beneath the killing intent of a biju. With it locked in place, Daiki summoned the contract he created from within the Dimension Force seal, opening it up and laying it down. Then, summoned a kanai to his hand. He tossed it out, burying it into the leg of the huge tiger. With how big it was, it was little more than an insect bite really, but the beast gave a startled roar, breaking out of its terror-filled state. And then with a thought, he summoned the bloodied kanai back to the Dimension Force seal and then back to his hand. He knelt down and layered the blood of the huge tiger through the contract matrix, just as the incredibly large feline predator roared and bound towards them. You're a real tough girl huh? Daiki praised, she wasn't even thinking of running. Seemingly, she was going to defend her home to her last breath. He could respect that. She leapt through the air and he stood up, forming his fingers into the ox seal, seal, he commanded. Chains of interlocked ceiling arrays erupted from the contract scroll, and just as her huge body soared over it, they shot up and wrapped around her body, holding her in place, then glowed a bright red. They only did so for a few seconds, before the chains of ceiling arrays seemed to seep into her body and she dropped to the ground in a daze, staring forward with glassy eyes. Shooting forward, Daiki grabbed the contract, before leaping up into the trees, a grin of success on his face. It worked, is that it? Hanabi asked, and was that Fuenjutsu? You must be really skilled to be able to use such a high level skill in Iki. I am pretty awesome. Daiki proudly agreed, so, let's have you sign the scroll and I'll teach you the summoning jutsu, okay? It's pretty easy. Air, okay, Hanabi agreed, but, shouldn't you, do something about her down there? Don't you need her permission or something? Eh, not really, Daiki shrugged. You just need to sign the contract and you can summon her, though, you'll have to win her allegiance yourself to get her to fight beside you once you summon her though, otherwise she'll probably attack you, but no big deal. Hanabi pursed her lips and frowned, Aniki, I'm beginning to believe you lack common sense, she pointed out. Underscore, later, Hanabi found herself walking through the halls of her clan compound, the sun was already beginning to set and she found, that she was exhausted. Daiki Aniki, was a monster. She had never felt so exhausted in her life. After their adventure in what he seemed to fondly call the forest of death, he had given her the summoning contract scroll he had created, had her sign it with her blood, taught her the signs for the ninjutsu he used to summon that incredibly massive and powerful looking beast he called Shiramari, and then forced her to train with him. And then when she couldn't go any longer, he healed her with medical ninjutsu and prompted her to go again. If this is how he typically trains with Hinata Nesama, it is no wonder she has improved so vastly. Hanabi thought tiredly, her arms feeling absolutely dumb to the bone while she carried a huge scroll almost as long as she was tall. Truly, Daiki Aniki was a monster and he made the harsh training she went through with her clan, seem paltry in comparison. It was no wonder he believed himself to be the most powerful genin in the village. Just as she turned the corner to the hallway where her room was located, she almost bumped into her father who was coming around at the same time. She was so exhausted her very senses were numb. Ah, Hanabi, I have been look, her father paused, frowning and looking her over, you look like you have been put through the ringer daughter. And that is an awfully big scroll you have there. What have you been up to I wonder? 
I was meeting the one whom Hinata Nesama has been training with lately, Hanabi informed her father, he is a formidable person and I see now that I need much more training. I asked him to teach me as he has been sister, and he agreed. This scroll is a summoning contract he made for me to show off his capability as a shinobi and prove his claim at being the strongest genin in the village. For the first time in her life that she could ever remember, Hanabi bore witness to her father gaping stupidly at her, as if she was speaking an alien language and grown a second head. Created a summoning contract, huh? Hiyashi Hayuga sputtered. You sure this will work? Daiki asked, standing in front of his pond. The clone he'd left behind yesterday while he went and played with Hanabi, had taken the time to finish up the renovations on the pond that Isogu desired. Well, beyond the other inhabitants. Finding some frogs shouldn't be too hard, but he wasn't sure about where to find some koi. Maybe he could ask Fu to summon him some. Yes, it may not be blood, but my chakra is more in tune with my essence, because I am chakra itself given form. Isobu assured. He'd drawn up another summoning contract now that he knew it worked, had imbued it with Isobu's chakra, forming a link. He just wasn't sure if it would work since it wasn't blood. Kurama was forced into a contract with Madara Uchiha. Remember? And I know from experience, blood from us will not work. Many have tried to force the issue with myself over the centuries. Do not worry, it will work. The huge turtle Biju expounded. Well, he was the one with more experience, so Daiki would trust in his words. He drew upon a tiny amount of Isobu's chakra, before focusing and running through a few hand seals, then slammed his hand down on the ground, summoning Jutsu. Isobu, he declared. He'd found in the process that beyond his main contract, he had to focus on Isobu specifically as well, which was kind of interesting as well and brought so many questions about the mental aspect of things and how it linked those who were connected to the contract. There was a puff of smoke in Daiki's chest, where his seal was located, gave a small thrumming throb, though not an uncomfortable feeling, and then when the smoke cleared, there was a small, tiny-looking Isobu on the ground, barely bigger than his palm. Ah, fresh air, how I... Isobu began basking in his newfound freedom, only to yelp as the tiny biju found himself snatched up by Daiki. Holy shit you're so cute buddy, Daiki exclaimed, grinning massively. Like seriously, he could carry him around on his shoulder like this, then if anyone wanted to fight he could be like, go Isobu, I choose you, use biju dama. I am not doing that, the tiny Isobu remarked dryly. Spoil sport. Hey wait, you can still hear my thoughts. Daiki realized and asked. This body is merely an extension of my main one, like the clones you can make, Isobu replied, and I can freely share my consciousness between these bodies I create. Huh. Wait, that was just like one of the abilities of the Rinnegan, at least as far as Nagato went. He couldn't remember if Obito could do it with his paths, but he assumed so considering how coordinated they were. Then again, who knew with that, they were reanimated Edo Tensai's after all. Then again, Kagaya had the Rinnegan herself, or was it the Rinnesharing and she had? Either way, she had it, so it may have been an ability inherited from her. Quite possibly, Isobu nodded his tiny head in agreement, now, put me down. Fine, fine. Daiki pouted, doing his told and lowering the tiny biju to the ground, who promptly wasted no time in hopping into the pond and disappearing beneath the water. Well, hopefully he enjoyed it. I should try and look into some barrier seals. Daiki mused. He had managed to learn something vaguely like a barrier seal, but it was more like a perimeter type thing that absorbed raw chakra from jutsu within its specific range. Something he picked up from studying the infinite armor he had on his shoulder. Which reminded him, I should probably convert the chakra I have in this into life force. He mused, looking at it on his shoulder. Hmm, no, wait, he'd do it come the chunin exams, give it a little bit more to build up. What to do now though? His clones were training away in Isobu's dimension out of sight, getting those jutsu down through the grind. He supposed that left him physical conditioning to do. Or, I could look into some more loot or upgrading, he thought. There were still many, many things out there to get his hands on to power up with. He hadn't been able to narrow down the traveling clan with Nurigui, the ferret that had part of the stone of Galel. Maybe it was about time to call in some help. And he had the perfect spy network to do the looking for him actually. He eyed the pond for a moment, before moving on, making his way around his large shiny new house and god did he love his epic new pad and stopped in his wide backyard. Then he ran through some hand seals again, summoning jutsu, 
He focused quite a decent chunk of his chakra and slammed his hand down on the ground. There was a massive puff of smoke and from it emerged an incredibly large pink chameleon that towered above him. Oh, Daiki, Toka peered down at him. Finally decided to stop relying on those eyes of yours as a crutch and work on your sensing abilities properly? His eye almost twitched. The annoying thing about her insults like this were the fact that she wasn't even trying to insult him. She was just blunt as shit and very matter of fact. Maybe later, Daiki rolled his eyes and replied, I've got a job for you and your clan if you're up for it. A few actually, but two specifically. Oh, Toka hummed with interest and crouched down so she was eye level with him. How odd, despite having the contract for months now, you have yet to summon any as for any important task or to aid you in a proper fight. Even when we would have been great aid, such as during your mission to Waterfall. Daiki winced, sorry, I'll call you guys out more often, he promised, like now, I have a totally important set of job for you guys. I am listening. Toka nodded once. How good are you guys at gathering intel? He asked. We are the best of course, Toka proudly replied. Do you need us to gather information on someone then? Pretty much, Daiki nodded. I need you guys to track down a clan for me. They're pretty much a civilian clan and they're constantly on the move. I don't have a name for them, but I know they have an elder called Kahiko and they're traveling with a specific ferret, yellow fur, red eyes. Hum, Toka hummed, a challenge at the very least, but, we'll find them for you. Good, she was confident in their ability at least. And the other one? She asked, you said there was a pair? Well, that one is easier, but you'll have to head to the land of snow for it, Daiki replied, and I don't know how good you guys are with the cold and all, being reptiles. Toka shrugged her scaly shoulders, a cold land is not ideal, but, there are of course members of our clan who have trained with fire chakra to ward off the cold effects, such as myself, she replied. Perfect then, Daiki grinned, I want you guys to steal something for me. It's a piece of chest armor owned by a guy called Dodo. He's the current leader of the Land of Snow. It's pitch black in color with a bit of blue on it and can absorb chakra. The guy is a shinobi alongside his subordinates, but not very good ones. They rely on this armor of theirs instead of their actual skills. Outside of their armor, any Jonin could mop them up. HMPH, is that all? Toka snorted. Such a pitiful target, not a challenge at all, unlike the first. I'll think of other challenging jobs for you later then, okay? Daiki snorted such a proud lizard. No wonder it was the chameleons that were approached by the snakes to try and make a dragon clan. They had the pride for it for sure, or Toka did at the very least. After Toka bid him goodbye to get started on the job he'd given her and her clan, Daiki decided, it was time for the daily grind. His destination of course was the ever epic training ground 69, his home, away from home. Maybe I should put a sign down claiming ownership of the place, he wondered. Could he even do that? Well, he could if he became Hokage he supposed. Training ground 69, personal training ground of the Hokage, hey. Daiki sighed, strolling leisurely along the pathway between the training grounds. The Sandame hadn't brought the topic up at all, not even hinted at it to his clones that saw the man practically every morning. All the man did was greet him, make small talk, ask how his training was going. It felt like the man was trying to give him space to think things through and not pressure him. But that in of itself was pressuring Daiki and he was doing his best not to think about it. There is no rush, that was what old man third claimed, but he was wrong, Daiki knew that, which was the problem. If there really wasn't a rush, he'd have accepted, because the offer was on the table plain as day. Personal instruction from the Sandame Hokage himself and probably access to the Forbidden Scroll. He could learn all he wanted and then pass the pie to Naruto a few years down the road or even Kakashi or something and let them become Hokage instead of him, step down for them. But, that couldn't happen, because, the Sandame had a death timer counting down right now and Daiki had no idea if he would be able to stop it. And if he did actually manage to stop it, he would probably have to pull out every damn trick in the book to do so. And if he failed, not only would his status as a Jinchuriki get revealed to pretty much everyone, he might actually be forced to take up the hat instead of Tsunade as the Sandame's chosen successor. Jiraiya wouldn't accept. Kakashi wouldn't accept. No way in hell would Danzo be allowed, and thus it would come down to either him or Tsunade. He could be fucking Hokage in less than three months from now. That was terrifying to think about. It was why he decided to push up his timetable and have the Chameleon clan search out that ferret so he could get his hands on a piece of the Stone of Galel. And while they were at it, stealing Dodo's armor as well. 
he had to get his hands on what he could. Because the thing was, he was actually very tempted to accept personal instruction from the legendary professor himself. The amount of jutsu he could get out of the man almost made him salivate. And beyond that, again, the forbidden scroll. The Edo Tensai. It could be a viable backup plan. If he failed and died, with the infinite armor, his eyes and enough chakra converted into life force, he could probably revive himself. Hell, Edo Tensai reanimations had pretty much infinite chakra. He could abuse the shit out of that with his eyes and his infinite armor. A failsafe in case he failed to get strong enough to deal with the Akatsuki. Plus beyond that, there were tons of powerful jutsu within that scroll, hell, if he wasn't wrong, the Hiraishin was in there as well. Daiki. Someone calling out his name broke him from his deep thoughts. Looking over his shoulder, Daiki saw that it was a familiar bun-haired girl, oh, hey Tenten, he waved to her. Seemed she and her team had returned from their little month-long training trip. I was just coming to look for you, she grinned, jogging over to him, how lucky, I was hoping we could train together a little bit. Fine with me, good to see you back, Daiki replied, so, how'd the training trip go? Tenten froze and then grimaced, it went, she trailed off, apparently having trouble finding a word to describe it. That bad huh? He snorted. Like you wouldn't believe, she sighed, shoulders slumping, we spent most of it doing physical training and sparring, well, me and Neji at least. Lee spent the entire month trying to get surface walking down. How'd he do? Daiki asked, raising an eyebrow, he was actually quite curious. So so, she shrugged, he managed to get it down enough to be usable in a fight, but that's about it. Well, at least there's that, he's getting there I suppose, Daiki shrugged. How about you, get the mystical palm down? She sighed again, not quite, I mean, I've managed to heal a few cuts with it, but it's nowhere close to perfect, she answered. Guy sensei didn't give me as much time to work on it as I would have liked. He wanted us to be in top physical condition for the Chunin exams over just a single jutsu. Well, Daiki could see where the man was coming from. As useful as the mystical palm jutsu was and god was it useful. It was a utility and support type jutsu, raw physical ability would be better for the Chunin exams. Tenten clapped her hands together and bowed her head to him. So, please help me out on perfecting the jutsu. The bun-haired girl pleaded. Sure, Daiki shrugged, his usual eye candy was busy today, he wouldn't say no to another, especially one not heavily in love with someone else, but we're getting this done today, I've got my own training to do after all. Her head whipped up and she grinned brightly at him, I I Daiki sensei. She chirped happily, thanks a bunch, she surprised him by wrapping her arms around him and hugging him tightly. Yeah, yeah. He smirked, rolling his eyes, though definitely not complaining about having a cute and curvy girl pressed up against him. It helped him focus for now. Again, it was the little things in life, or, well, not quite so little in Tenten's case. Mystical palm jutsu training, ah, damn it. Tenten cursed, picking up the dead fish sitting on the ground in front of her and tossing it through the air. Well, it wasn't going well. Daiki, Mid-hand stand push-up watched it soar into the sky and disappear over the tree line. Maybe some normal fish alongside the koi? He mused. I just don't get what I'm doing wrong. The girl jumped to her feet and kicked a small rock laying nearby, sending it up through the horizon, following the fish. To be honest, neither did he. As far as he could tell, she had the necessary chakra control, she was able to activate the jutsu and she had no problem maintaining it. Even with his eyes, he couldn't see anything really wrong with her control over the jutsu, it should be working. And she confirmed she was able to heal small cuts as well. Perhaps she has a problem visualizing the technique and Isobu offered his input. Unlike most other jutsu where you merely shape it, this technique I've noticed through your usage, has a mental control aspect to it because of the multiple ways it can be used. Hmm. Maybe. Pushing up with his hands. Daiki flipped into the air and landed on his feet seamlessly, even though he was wearing 8,000 pounds on each limb now. He could probably clap some ninja just by throwing one of his weights at them. What do you think about when using the jutsu? Daiki asked her. Hmm? Tenten looked at him and shrugged, nothing much, well, like I try and visualize it working now, but other than that nothing else, I just use it like any other jutsu. Huh, Isobu was spot on the money. Much like you yourself. You tend to miss the trees for the forest, focusing on the final goal rather than the step-by-step -step process. Isobu added. Hey, he didn't do that, much. 
he had to weigh the pros and cons of doing shit anyway, one wrong step and he could get fucked over right proper. Besides, much of the things he'd like to change, needed a vast amount of strength to do anything about. Strength he didn't have without Isogu himself backing him up, which wasn't an option right now when he wanted to hide his status until he was strong enough for it not to matter that the Akatsuki would come after him. Yeah, that's your problem, Daiki pointed out to the girl. The mystical palm has a bunch of uses despite only being a single jutsu, like it can heal, it can be used to examine the body itself, it can be used to numb pain, the healing part is actually one of the simpler parts of it. Wait, really? Tenton blinked, that's it? That's all I'm missing? She gawked at him? Pretty much I think. Daiki confirmed. No way, she shook her head, then scowled, that can't be it. I've been working on this jutsu for an entire year now, more even, nearly two, it can't be that simple. Ish, she was pissed. Well, he couldn't blame her. Sucks to suck, he snorted, or well, the guy who taught you this jutsu sucks ass at least. Hmm, now that he thought about it. There was no mention of the visualizing part of things in the scroll he got either, he just associated that kind of thing with a lot of fiction so went about that route automatically. That might be an interesting avenue to explore with other jutsu now that he thought about it. You can't be serious. Tenton shook her head, but despite her refuting his words, her shoulders slumped in defeat. Well, let's find out if I'm right or not then. Daiki smirked at her, summoning a kunai to his hand and then promptly stabbing it straight through the middle of his palm. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Tenton gaped, going wide-eyed in shock. Nah, I'm a badass, he shrugged, ignoring the pain. He was getting good at that actually, ever since he got his shit absolutely kicked in by that cunt Suen. Pain was just weakness leaving the body as it grinded to an all new level, I'm a badass who currently can't make hand seals though who will bleed out and die if you don't heal me. No he wouldn't actually, hell, no ninja would bleed out and die from something as slight as this. It did spur Tenton into action though, she was only a few feet away, but she rushed to him so fast one might have think she had learned to teleport. She grabbed his hand, ripping the kunai out, blood spurting from the wound and quickly formed a familiar hand seal, green chakra forming around her hands and being directed into the stab through his hand. It took a few minutes, and neither made a sound, her because she was concentrating so much in Daiki because he didn't want to spook her out of her little zone, but finally, the wound began to slowly close. Good thing it was shallow, kind of. And well, Isobu would take care of the bone. I can't believe you did that, are you stupid? Tenton growled at him when she finally finished, sweat matting her forehead, you could have seriously hurt yourself, and what, just to make me take your advice and try it out on the spot? Daiki's smirk had not disappeared, in fact, it just grew bigger, to shit-eating proportions. Hey, I was right though wasn't I? He smugly pointed out. Besides, have you thought that maybe I just wanted to hold hands with a cute girl? Tenton blinked in surprised at his words, before looking down at their hands, specifically, her cupped ever so gently around his own. Her cheeks flushed, and she quickly let go of him and stood back. You really are just an idiot aren't you? She shook her head, with those weights and crazy physical conditioning you do. You're totally cut from the same cloth as Guy Sensei and Lee. Hey, now that's just insulting, Daiki huffed, crossing his arms, I'm my own brand of idiot actually. An awesome, ultra-powerful and epically sexy idiot, I'll have you know. No lie there. He was built like a god, with muscles carved from marble, and a super ultra epic Manda 2.0 that even Manda himself would recoil in fear from and bow down before. Tenton couldn't help herself, erupting into a slew of giggles, you're so full of yourself, she said, before sighing and smiling gratefully at him, but, thank you, I finally got this jutsu down thanks to you. No biggie, he shrugged, though he was curious, why have you been so determined to learn this? All the time you put into this could have been used on something else instead when you saw you weren't getting anywhere. Tenton sighed, it's been my dream since I was little to be like Tsunade-sama, she revealed, smiling a little melancholy smile his way, I want to be a legendary Kunoichi like her, but I've never been able to even come close to the path she went down. I don't have a super lineage or superhuman strength. I absolutely suck at medical ninjutsu as you can tell. I blew getting a summoning contract because I was too absorbed in the thought of a legendary one like the slugs. She shook her head and then met his eyes, I gave up on ever being like her, but I wanted to at least get this jutsu down at the very least, it was like a test for myself you know. I mean, you don't need to be like her to be a legendary kunoichi, or be stronger than her. Daiki pointed out with a shrug, 
Tsunade was kind of a low bar personally for him considering how strong he wanted to get. Besides, there's other summoning contracts out there and the slugs aren't even all that powerful and most of her superhuman strength comes from a jutsu of her creation. Hindsight and all that, right? Tenten rubbed the back of her head sheepishly, honestly, I've got my own path now, weapons and summoning are my things now, though I wish I realized that before I made a fool of myself in front of the tortoise summons and, she trailed off, cheeks flushing. And, Daiki raised an eyebrow, she looked embarrassed now, was it something juicy? And before, before I tried gambling to be like her, she admitted self-consciously, I kept getting kicked out of gambling halls, and one guy even said I'd never be like Tsunade because she had legendary huge boobs and I don't. Daiki couldn't help it, he burst out laughing, he didn't remember anything like that happening. Oh come on, Tenten whined, it's not that funny. Kinda is, Daiki refuted, before getting his laughter under control, either way, you're doing pretty fine now and you've got nothing to be ashamed about on that front. She paused and furrowed her brows, what do you mean, she asked, confused. Daiki grinned and shrugged, before gesturing to her with a wave of his hands. You've got a pretty big set of tits on you, nice ones too. He pointed out and unashamedly looked down and said pretty big tits. You're pretty damn hot in general. Probably one of if not the hottest girl in our age group in the village. She was definitely up there for sure. For a moment, Tenton just gaped at his upfront compliment, cheeks blazing red, before she sighed and pawned her forehead. Don't just say that to a girl, don't you have any delicacy you idiot? She groaned. What's that? Can you eat it? His grin got bigger. She snorted, not cute Daiki, not cute at all, Tenton retorted, before sighing and smiling at him. Still, thanks for the compliment I guess, you're not so bad looking yourself. Babe, I'm hotter than the sun, Daiki refuted with a shrug. One only had to look at his glorious muscles to understand that, so, now that you've got that down, how about we go grab a bite to eat? Are you inviting me out on a date? Tenton raised an eyebrow at him. Yup. He nodded. Okay, Tenton nodded, accepting his offer. Good shit, his grin returned and he held his arm out for her, it's customary where I'm from for a girl to hold onto the guy on a date. Nice try, but no, she replied dryly, now that I know how big of a pervert you are, I'm gonna be keeping my eye on you buddy. Well, couldn't blame a guy for trying. Hours later, after the sun had set, Daiki returned home, a wide grin on his face. He'd had a great ass fun time with Tenton. After eating, she'd actually shown him about some places he didn't know of, like, an arcade. He didn't know Konoha had an arcade. The games weren't electrical and stuff like from his other life beyond a few, and were mostly things like accuracy toss games for winning prizes, but there were a few interesting things like sparring rings where young Shinobi and Kunoichi could pick fights and spar with each other for fun. Honestly, it was a good time and Tenten was good company, she bounced off him pretty well his personality, not his dick mind you, though he'd like that too. She was apparently so used to playing the straight man or rather woman, with Rock Lee and Guy, that his upfront attitude apparently didn't bother her all that much. That and he knew she got a bit of a kick out of him checking her out and complimenting her, he didn't need to use his eyes to read her mind for that either, the little half smiles she tried to hide from him were enough proof of that. He paused by the pond and eyed it, but he couldn't see shit in there without shifting his vision. How's your day been? He asked internally. Quite enjoyable thank you, Isobu replied. Did anybody check the place out while I was out? He asked. No, none that I could sense at least, Isobu informed. Good enough for him. Isobu was pretty skilled when it came to noting the presence of others, even Anbu had trouble hiding from him. He was a smart and skilled turtle bro. Shrugging, Daiki continued on making his way into the house. He was heading straight for his bedroom for now. He was about to dispel his clones for the day, so none of them popped during the night and woke him up. He paused as he entered the bedroom though and stared. There, in the middle of his bed, was a familiar piece of black chest armor with a note on top. Instinctually he walked over and picked up the note, reading it. That was too easy Daiki, find something more challenging to steal next time, Toka. Well that was fucking fast. Daiki gaped. Man, chameleons were so fucking awesome. The Hokage bunker was abuzz with noise. Usually a quiet place, it was a large room located under the Hokage tower itself, 50 feet underground and with only the Hokage themselves able to enter and access the room. But that was not so today. Today, the room was filled to the absolute brim. Many a top Jonin were gathered alongside dozens of active Chunin. Elite Jonin, special Jonin, clan heads, advisors and all. 
Despite how many of them that had gathered though, there was a large, respectful distance between the gathered ninja and where the Hokage sat behind a desk, comfortably resting on an incredibly large and soft throne-like chair. His advisors and former teammates flanked him from each side, Homura Maitokudo, an old, stern-faced man with rectangular spectacles and Kaharu Yutatane, an old bun-haired woman with just as stern a face as her glasses-wearing comrade. As you all know, it is that time of the year again, Sarutobi spoke up, his voice immediately halting any voices from the gathered ninja and allowing his words to carry over the large room easily. The Chunin exams are once again upon us and it is now time to determine who of our genin will be taking part in the exams. He let his words hang in the air a bit, looking through the gathered ninja slowly before nodding. First, I think we'll hear from the those teaching the newest squads of genin, the Sandame continued, his eyes lingering on three specifically of the gathering, Kakashi, Asuma, Kuranai, your thoughts? At his prompting, the three names stepped forward out of the crowd of ninja, a beautiful dark-haired woman with striking red eyes and a scruffy bearded janin with an unlit cigarette hanging from his mouth. Kakashi was the first one to speak, looking up from his ever-present book, I Kakashi Hitaki, leader of Team 7, nominate Sasuke Uchiha, Sakura Haruno and Naruto Uzumaki to take part in the Chunin exams, he stated clearly and loudly. For a second, there was silence, before a chorus of shocked exclamations and mutters resounded from behind him. A rookie team, is he crazy? Oh come on Kakashi, are you kidding? Sasuke Uchiha I can see, but that Uzumaki brat, he's useless. And so on and so forth, the many were trying to get on Kakashi's case about his bold nomination, but he ignored them boredly. Things only became more heated when Asuma and Kuranai nominated their own rookie genin teams to take part in the exams. Especially Kuranai, being only a recently promoted janin, having only been one for a few months before becoming a squad leader and sensei. All of them, huh? Sarutobi mused with a light grin, how rare. Few genin teams after all, were talented enough to be nominated for the chunin exams within their first six months of being proper ninja and leaving the academy behind. Hold on a second. A scar-faced chunin spoke up. Uruka stormed his way to the front and glared at the three senseis of the nominated rookie genin teams. You three can't be serious. The chunin and academy teacher glared at them for a moment before turning and bowing to the Hokage. I'm sorry for speaking out of turn Hokage-sama, but please allow me to say my piece, he apologized. The Hokage raised an eyebrow, but that was all, before merely waving his hand and gesturing for the man to say his piece. Uruka nodded, before turning to the three. I may be speaking out of line. But I know these kids, I taught them for years, it's only been six months, they're not ready, he stated firmly, they're talented for sure, each and every one of them in their own way, but the Chunin exams is on another level, are you trying to get these kids crushed? I became a Chunin when I was six, seven years younger than Naruto, Kakashi pointed out with a shrug. Uruka paused, registering his words, before his glare became lethal, this isn't just about Naruto, he spat, not a single one of them are ready not even Sasuke, they need more experience. A lot can change in six months, Kuranai refuted him. Hinata for instance has changed massively in the last few months and grown in leaps and bounds, she may very well be the strongest of her graduating class now. Kakashi snorted. Oh, you disagree? Kuranai challenged him. I'm actually in a position to comment because I taught these kids some at the academy myself before I became a janin. You may think Sasuke is the strongest, but I'm well aware of his talent and I was already a chunin myself at their age, yet, I believe I would not be able to defeat Hinata as I was at her age. Hiyashi Hayuga, standing alongside his few clan heads, perked up at the mention of his daughter, his lips for a brief moment, twitching upwards, before being hidden by an impassive frown a split second later. No actually, while Sasuke has definitely come a long way himself and grown by leaps and bounds, I already know who the strongest genin is in the village, taking every single one of them into account, Kakashi shrugged, and it definitely isn't the cute little Hayuga heiress, and I wouldn't be bragging so much about her strength, it isn't exactly your doing. Kuranai's mouth dropped at his casual dismissal of her efforts as a sensei, but before she could fire back, Asuma stepped between them, now now guys, let's calm down, no need to get all fired up, the heir of the Sarutobi laughed lightly, I think my kids are pretty talented as well, which is why I'm recommending them. Kakashi shrugged uncaringly, while Kuranai huffed and crossed her arms, HMPH, probably just going to make a stupid joke about Naruto being the best or something anyway, 
despite how untalented he is, she muttered. Kakashi's eyes narrowed ever so slightly and Aruka outright glared at the woman, opening his mouth to reply. Only for a cough to interrupt them. Well, I suppose this is as good a time as any then, the Sandame drew the attention back to him, but now that Kakashi has brought the subject up, I will be personally pushing forth a single genin to take part in the exams. All eyes in the room whipped to him. Here is an, Kaharu asked, looking at him oddly. With all eyes on him, Hiruzen merely placed his hand under his desk, and the wall behind him slid apart to reveal a large screen embedded within the wall. A second later, it lit up, displaying the ninja registration and information page of a broad-shouldered, tan-skinned and crimson-red-eyes teenager. Daiki. Aruka went absolutely wide-eyed. Unnoticed by many, Hiyashi straightened up and paid special attention at the mention of the boy's name. Kakashi mentioned him offhand, but this is Daiki Yurei. A genin I specifically have my eye on, here is an explained to the gathered ninja. Currently, he has completed 64 D rank missions. 3 C rank missions, 1 B rank mission and 1 S rank mission, currently a member of the genin corps. He graduated 6 months ago and failed the exam placed by his Janin sensei of the time, since then, he has trained rigorously and has personally killed no less than 5 Janin. One a former member of the 7 swordsmen of the mist and beyond my dear friend Kosuke has the highest kill count of any genin in the village, with over 100 confirmed kills to his name. For a moment, there was absolute silence, before the gathered ninja once again broke into a cacophony of noise. Five janin, forget that, a member of the seven swordsmen, as a rookie genin? Am I hearing this right? He's gotta be kidding right, and what's with that absurd number of D ranks? No, ignoring all that. What's a kid who accomplished all this and has the eye of the Hokage himself doing in the core what absolute idiot failed this kid? Genma Shiranui near the back of the room winced, ducking his head out of view of any scanning the room. Daiki? Kurenai frowned. I don't remember him standing out much, he was middle of the pack at best within the academy, are you sure Hokage-sama? You really shouldn't talk Kurenai, you mainly taught Genjutsu classes and were only at the academy for a couple of months. Baruka cut in, Daiki was one of the most talented of the class, rivaled only by Sasuke Uchiha. The only reason he was ranked much lower was because he pursued every shinobi art at once, taijutsu, ninjutsu, genjutsu, bukajutsu, everything taught at the academy, he pursued instead of focusing on one or two like most others. I specifically noted in his examination papers that should he find a focus, he would no doubt be the best of his graduating class by far, surpassing even Sasuke. E.H., kid did you one better, Kakashi shrugged, he just trained even harder, the kid's a training maniac that puts guy to shame, trains from dawn till dusk until complete exhaustion, every single day. Indeed, the Sandame nodded in agreement, young Daiki-kun is a splendid shinobi, physically fast and strong enough to fight a taijutsu specialist Janin, ninjutsu capability that few can match, a massive chakra capacity, a near expert in fuinjutsu. A very special pair of genjutsu to his name and even capable of using elemental jutsu from every element with a variety of B and A ranked jutsu under his belt. Nobody said a thing in response, too busy digesting what was said and none had the bravery to question the Hokage's decision. Shock though was the most prevalent feeling throughout the room. None felt more so than Aruka at the progress his former student had made. Well, none that is, but Kakashi, by the way Kurenai. He's the one you can thank for the Hyuga era's change in attitude, Kakashi helpfully informed with a wide eye smile. He usually trains at training ground 69 if you want to go thank him for doing your job for you. Kurenai's fingers flexed, hands balling into fists, but she held her tongue instead of retorting to Kakashi's baiting, her eyes narrowed into an angry glare upon his form though. From there, things proceeded, with the rest of the senseis speaking up and nominating or declining their team's entry into the exam. None spoke about Daiki Yure any longer, despite the burning question many of them all shared. Why was he being allowed to participate without a team? But none had the gall to question the Hokage's decision. Things only really perked up at all again when Aruka spoke up and pleaded with the Hokage for the chance to test the rookie genin teams, and would wholeheartedly agree with the decisions made by the the rookie team senseis if they passed his test. The Hokage left the decision up to the senseis themselves. Kakashi and Asuma agreeing without a fuss. Kurenai on the other hand, I'm all for it. I have faith in Team 8, she declared, but then looked to the Hokage and bowed her head, on that note Hokage-sama, 
I request the permission to test Daiki Yurei myself. I wish to confirm the skills you speak so highly of, she asked of him. The Sandame raised an eyebrow at her, but merely nodded, very well, I give you permission to do so, he agreed, I should warn you though, not to take him lightly. He informed her, narrowing her eyes and pinning her in place with the seriousness of his gaze. Thank you Hokage-sama. Kuranai bowed her head, ignoring the eyes her request had drawn to her. Kuranai knew she was being petty. It should be beneath her, as a janin to get so riled up over a genin. Especially when he wasn't even the one that instigated her bad mood in the first place. It was Kakashi. But then, Kakashi had a habit of riling up everyone and anyone, and he had a grand old time doing it for the most part. But, it was mainly because it was Kakashi, that she got riled up so much in the first place. The legendary copy ninja, Kakashi of the Sharingan, the pride and joy of the Yandaimi Hokage, whispered about on the streets as the one who would become Hokage when the Sandame stepped down once again, living up to his sensei's legacy. It irked her just thinking about him in that regard, but then, he irked a lot of people with his reputation. She had only become a janin less than a year ago. Kakashi had been one since he was 13, months before she even hit Chunin. Being in his generation, constantly in his shadow, not even considered second best compared to him, it grated sometimes, especially when he acted as smug as he did. And he could be a right dick about things and knew exactly how to press on a sore spot. After the biggest failing in her career and entire life really, just when she thought she could finally put it past her, that Hinata's positive changes washed that failure away. Kakashi just had to snatch it away from her. Kurenai bit her lip, eyes narrowing into a glare as she stared down at her target. She was currently nestled within the branches and foliage of a tree, within the Uchiha clan district. It was only due to the Hokage himself graciously telling her of where the boy lived, that she found him, otherwise she would have had to wait, probably until the next morning, when he made his way back to the training ground Kakashi told her of. As it was, she'd been here for an hour now, watching Daiki Yure. She had to admit, he had endurance in spades, he'd been training outside the back of his home for an hour straight, and again she had to admit, he was well built, the teen was shirtless, his face and torso covered in a shiny layering of sweat, but not once had he faltered, despite the fact he seemed to be wearing weights just like Guy usually did in his training. Good endurance maybe, but his sensing skills clearly need a lot of work, she noted critically, he hadn't noticed her at all. Her team would have noticed her long before now, true, her team were a tracking team built for that kind of aspect of ninja life, but considering the praise this boy had thrown about over him ba. You can come out now. His voice broke her from her thoughts and Kuranai gave a start, when she realized, he was staring right at her, as if he could see her through where she'd completely hidden her body. Her eyes widened, has he known I've been here the whole time? She gaped. Was he just letting her spy on him then and didn't care? Why speak up now though, unless he was done with his training or something? Shaking her head, Kuranai focused herself and scratched her previous thoughts. Clearly his sensing abilities were top notch. Doing as he said, she revealed herself, leaping from the tree to land a few feet away from him. The boy, the very broad-shouldered boy she mentally corrected raised an eyebrow at her and looked almost confused, Kuranai sensei. He at least recognized her, what are you doing here? He asked, confused, though his confusion didn't stop his eyes from straying over his body, like a typical teenager and briefly ogling at her body. He left the question of why she was spying on him unasked though. Kuranai crossed her arms and smiled at the boy, good that you found me, I suppose your sensing skills are on point, she relayed her thoughts from before to him, how about your intelligence, can you guess why I'm here Daiki-san? A test, his second eyebrow joined the first, before he snorted and crossed his arms as well and smirked at her, a cocky smirk that looked right at home on his face, then this isn't about Hinata, so, the Chunin exams? She couldn't say why she wasn't surprised at all at the fact someone spoken of in such regard by Kakashi wore a cocky smirk so naturally. She ignored the mention of Hinata, you catch on fast, she praised lightly, yes. To make things simple, you have been recommended for the Chunin exams, but many including myself are a little skeptical of a rookie genin like yourself being able to handle the exams, so I've been sent here to test your capability. For a moment, he just stared at her, before huffing in apparent amusement, skeptical huh? He mused. I bet you weren't skeptical when you recommended your own team for the exams. Her eyes widened. How did yo, I didn't, but you just told me, not really good at keeping a tight lip on things huh Kuranai sensei? The boy taunted her. A genin just taunted her, 
Ajanan. Honestly, I don't really see what business it is of yours, especially since I know for a fact the Hokage wouldn't prompt this. Old Man Third already offered me a promotion to Chunin. I'm only taking this exam because he asked me to. Unlike your team, my promotion is a foregone conclusion. Kuranai gaped at the boy. He was so arrogant in his ability. He was much more blunt about it and outspoken, but he really did remind her of Kakashi right now, right down to the looking down on her team as being weaker than him. This was the boy that changed Hinata. How? Honestly, she didn't want to imagine what kind of arrogant brow beating he gave her if this was how he acted to a superior. Forget being petty, she would enjoy knocking this kid down a peg. Regardless, I'm here now in my capacity as a Jonin to test your worthiness to enter the Chunin exams. Kuranai narrowed her eyes at him. How about no? Daiki snorted, I was humoring you before, but honestly, what gives you the right to judge me? I'll pass and just go see the Hokage, I get absolutely nothing out of humoring you. What? Such self-assuredness in his position. What Jenin acted like this with a Janin and seemed to think they were the ones with the high ground. She really wanted to plant his face in the dirt. What do you want out of this then? Kuranai found herself asking, her arms tightening under her bust and pushing her chest up inadvertently. His eyes flickered to her cleavage, before he shrugged, there's nothing you have that I want. He said and dismissed her with a wave of his hand, turning to walk away and head into his home. Dismissing a Janin as if beneath him, this kid. What if I get naked then if you beat me? Her mouth moved before her brain and she offered. He hadn't been able to hide his interest in her body at least. Her brain caught up and agreed with her actions. It wasn't like a Jenin could beat her anyway. It was impressive he'd been on an S-class mission. But she'd been on multiple by time she was his age. Just because he was on such a mission, didn't mean he contributed much. Daiki froze before turning to her with a wide grin. Well, you spied on me half naked for an hour. I guess it's only fair if I get to see you naked as well. He accepted, seemingly believing his victory was assured. Kuranai winced, a flash of guilt assaulting her as she processed his words. She had been spying on a boy half her age, that wasn't a good look for her was it? Instigating a fight with him as well just because of how cocky he was, so petty of. Her eyes widened as he blurred and was suddenly in front of her, the weights on his arms and legs gone almost instantly and his fist lashing out at her face. Fast. So fast, faster than a genin had any right to be. His attack was so sudden and fast, Kuranai barely had time to react and could only get her hands up in a cross block and backpedal. She hadn't expected him to attack instantly upon accepting. Just as his fist made impact with her arms and they throbbed with pain, his palm opened up and suddenly a shock wave of force barreled into her as the force of his blow lifted her bodily into the air. She found herself flying backwards through the air, but ignoring it, she quickly ran through hand seals, demonic illusion, tree binding death. She resorted to one of her most powerful genjutsu on instinct as he powered rapidly after her with a shunshin. Only he didn't stop. She felt the chakra of her contact make contact, and, nothing, he didn't even blink. His shunshin enhanced speed made it so he was on her before she even hit the ground. On instinct, she grabbed a handful of kanai and launched them at him point blank. She'd take a hit, but he wouldn't be able to avoid them from this close range. Only they flew right through him as if he were a mirage and before her away, the daiki charging her faded away. Clone, she gaped, no, that was different from. Just then, an arm wrapped around her throat, and another around her stomach pinning her arms and dragged her down. And dead if you were an enemy, daiki's voice rumbled in her ear. The boy's head was peeking just over her shoulder, since she was a few inches taller than him his muscular arms pinning her against his chest and keeping her from moving. How? Kuranai could merely ask after floundering for a few moments trying to think. That clone was an overworld genjutsu and genjutsu itself doesn't work on me, Daiki explained, don't feel too bad about about it Kuranai sensei, I'm really just your worst possible matchup. Despite the situation, Kuranai couldn't help but snort, don't feel too bad? I just got beaten in less than 10 seconds by a genin, she replied, Genjutsu not working on you isn't an excuse, you overwhelmed me with your speed, strength, that shockwave that hit me, switching with the clone without me even noticing and getting behind me. Well, there was nothing for it, the Hokage wasn't downplaying the boy at all, you're definitely capable of taking the Chunin exams, as you said, she admitted, you win, she conceded. And my prize? The young teen asked and she could see him grinning excitedly in her peripheral. She huffed, and again despite the situation, she couldn't help but smirk in amusement, I'm a woman of my word, 
why don't we go outside out of view and I'll do as I promised, she replied. She hadn't even imagined losing to him, never mind so thoroughly, really, he earned it. All right then, come on. He unwound his arms from around her, but not before taking a quick squeeze of her backside as he pulled back. She jumped a little, before giving him a narrowed-eyed glance and turning around to look him in the eye, I never said you could touch, Kurinai reprimanded. And you never said I couldn't, the boy unashamedly grinned at her, and eagerly grabbed her by the wrist and pulled her alongside with him. Her stomach twisted with a bit of heat, she always did like a guy who took charge. He led her into the large home and through a long sweeping and tastefully, if basically decorated hallways. Since it was basically his reward and to make up for how pushy she was now that she'd cooled down, she let him take the lead, and examined his house. What's a kid, an orphan even, doing with a place like this? She couldn't help but be a little gobsmacked at his home. It was an expensive clan house, no way a genin should be able to afford it, hell she couldn't. Well, Hokage-sama did claim he killed a member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Kurinai remembered, she'd thought before he'd just been on a mission with some janin, but no, perhaps he had killed the missing ninja himself and claimed the bounty? A second later, he pulled her into a living room, and it was quite the place. Simple, with little decoration. A long gray couch, two armchairs, a table in the middle and a large television hung on the wall and a large fireplace, while the flooring itself was wooden. There was a large and comfortably looking shaggy white fur rug in front of the fireplace. Daiki separated from her as he closed the door behind them and turned to her, grin still splitting his face, well, he prompted her. Well what? She smirked back, cocking her hip to the side, you're going to have to tell me what you want, she teased. She may as well get some fun out of this. Is that right? The kid was all balls. She had to admit that, he didn't seem nervous in the least. Well, it wasn't unheard of for Jen in his age to make a beeline for brothels. She knew her on again off again boyfriend Asuma did so himself at around his age, alongside the likes of Jenma and Hayate. He reached out and grasped her by the wrist, and Kuranai let him tug her over to the center of the living room, in front of the couch. Get that dress off. He outright ordered her. If that's what you want, she purred, giving the boy a wink and sauntering forward a few steps. Hips swinging as she reached down and grasped her bandage-like dress at the junction at her thighs and then in one smooth motion pulled it up over her head, leaving her entirely naked beyond her sandals and black thong. Well, what do you think of your prize then? Kuranai asked, giving the young teen her most bewitching smile over her shoulder as she kneeled on his couch and bared her large, round ass to him. He boldly stepped forward and his hand came out swatting her across the ass cheek, she gasped at his boldness, then her eyes went wide as he reached around her, his palm filling with one of her large breasts, and she had to stop from moaning as his fingers found her rosy nipple and pinched lightly. Amazing, what an amazing ass, but the deal was fully naked, wasn't it? His voice was a demanding growl in her ear, shit, and these tits too, fucking huge. No wonder you're Hinata's sensei. His other hand came around and grabbed her by her other breast and he greedily began groping and squeezing her tits. What do you, Kuranai began at the mention of her student, briefly cut off by her voice mewling. A small crackle fizzled from his fingers and buzzed over her nipples just as he gave both a small pinch and pull. A short burst of tingling pleasure shooting down her spine, mean? She gasped out. Was that lightning manipulation? She could feel her thong dampen. This kid was something else. Using his ninjutsu training on her like that without even asking, what a beast. She groaned inwardly, the heat in her belly becoming an inferno. She's into Naruto, Daiki grunted, his hands coming back to grasp her large breasts fully after letting go of her nipples and used his grip on her tits to pull her back into his chest. She took my advice and got hot as shit to snatch him up. Do you know how much blue balls I've worked up with her dancing around now? But I'm not gonna take advantage of her even though I know I could. And just as I said, you make a fine fucking sensei for her, you're both stacked and hot as all fuck. So it was him that helped Hinata, Kakashi was right then, it was bitterly annoying for a moment, before being replaced with gratitude. She loved that girl like a little sister and it did her the world of good. The fact he was good enough to not take advantage of her and help her pursue the one she wanted, made her want to thank the boy. She supposed she could ease up some of that pressure for him, for one night. I suppose we make a good pair then me and her, Kuranai purred throatily, and arched her back into him, grinding her ass against his crotch and wasn't at all surprised to feel something hard and throbbing press into her in response. Why don't I thank you properly in her place then? She looked over her shoulder at him once again with a smoldering gaze. 
Her question made him pause in his groping of her. You serious? He asked, letting go and stepping back. She was. I haven't been laid in months. She mentally griped, and so smirked at the boy challengingly. What? Where's all that confidence from before? She taunted. Daiki stared at her for a moment in surprise, before grinning massively, eyes lighting up with lust and touched a palm to his pants, and suddenly, they were just gone, leaving him entirely bare from the waist down, his hand going to the base of his manhood and stroking it. No take backs then when I'm fucking you silly, he threatened. Kurinai's eyes widened massively in shock and her mouth hung low at the absolute massive club of a cock the boy had between his legs, the largest she'd come across by a decent margin. Holy hell. Oh, I won't, she promised, very eagerly. Kurinai spread her knees wider and reached back, pulling her thong to the side and revealing her dripping wet snatch. She really needed to get fucked, I'll hold you to it even big boy. So why don't you claim your prize properly? She wiggled her full ass from side to side invitingly. You know after earlier, I'm really gonna enjoy this even more. He bared his sharp teeth at her and stepped forward, roughly grasping her by the hair, fisting his hand into her long raven black tresses and lining herself up with her womanhood. And then he was pushing into her, both of them groaning as her pussy was stretched farther than ever before and 12 inches deep, her velvety walls doing their very best to wring his young cocky cum from his balls. Kurinai's eyes went wide, before rolling into the back of her head, the buildup already forcing that quark loose and she shook as she orgasmed for the first time in months. And by god was it good. You know, you were quite the bitch earlier, Daiki grunted and she whined as he began to ease himself out of her, dragging his length ever so slowly until only the fat head of his cock remained inside her, but tonight, you're gonna be my bitch, aren't you? He yanked on her head, exposing her neck and leaning down to hungrily kiss her pulse point. So demanding and rough, so big and full of lust, it was so so good. Kurinai could only moan, wiggling her hips and pleading him for more. She never imagined things would go like this. Aren't you? He repeated, his other hand whipping out to slap her across the ass, sending her ass cheeks jiggling wildly, a red hand print left behind on her pale skin. Yes. Kurinai moaned submissively for the boy, giving in entirely, she needed this. And then he thrust forward, with all the power of a raging tailed beast and slammed his full length into her, hard her vision going white with spasms of pleasure. And soon the living room was filled with her moaning, squealing and the sound of her ass cheeks clapping. Underscore, hey, hey Kurinai sensei, wake up. A light slapping on her cheek drew Kurinai from her slumber. Uh, she groaned, eyes bleary, where was she? Looking around with hazy eyes, she noticed she was in an unfamiliar large bed, in a sparsely decorated room. A light slap on her cheek made her look to the side, and taken the form of a young, muscular teenager, naked as the day he was born and an absolutely huge cock standing up like a tower. Her eyes widened and everything came rushing back, her getting pissed off and petty because of Kakashi, taking it out on a genin, the bed she made with him, him clobbering her and then taking her as his prize and fucking her. And what a fucking it had been, rough, fast-paced and with little mercy involved. Daiki had his complete way with her and she allowed it, for hours on end. No matter how many times he came, he didn't go down, it was the most wild, intense fucking of her life. Kurinai swallowed heavily before pushing herself up and trying to stand, her legs feeling like jelly, her large breasts swinging lewdly beneath her under the gaze of the genin who as he promised, fucked her absolutely silly. Even now her cunt still felt full. W what time is it? She asked blearily. Morning, time for me to get back to the grind, so I figured I'd wake you up. Daiki shrugged unbothered by either of their nakedness or his raging towering erection. I comma I have to go, I need to get ready to meet my team. She swallowed heavily and tore her eyes away from his cock, lest she be tempted. God he was an animal that just could not be satiated. This, this can't happen again. She decided, she couldn't have something like this getting around to her genin team, or worse, Kakashi, the smug looks he'd give her would drive her mad. Once I leave here, we're done, and don't tell anybody about this, she told him. On shaky legs, she looked around the room for her clothes, but just as she stepped past him, his hand grabbed her by the hair. Fair enough, once we leave, this is the end of this, I can't have you getting in the way of my grind anyway, the teen agreed, then manhandled her to her knees and sat down on the bed before her, his cock bobbing almost menacingly before her eyes, now take care of this. Kurinai swallowed before glaring up at him from between his legs, what did I just say? You've not left yet, as far as I'm concerned. 
you're still my bitch that I made squeal all through the night, he grinned savagely at her, then suddenly cocked his head to the side and his grin widened, in fact, I quite like hearing you squeal, such a sexy sound. With how exhausted and numb her body was, Kuranai only had time for her eyes to widen, before he grasped her under the armpits and lifted her up into the air as if she were a feather and then pulled her down and sheathed his huge cock into her in one smooth motion. Oh fuck, Kuranai screamed, pleasuring ripping through her body, on instinct her arms and legs wrapped around his body, squashing her big round breasts into the team's chest, while his hands dropped down to grasp her by the ass cheeks and begin to savagely bounce her up and down on his cock like his own personal pleasure toy. And so, it begins. Standing before the entrance to the academy, Daiki had his arms crossed as he leaned against a familiar tree, right next to a very, very important swing set. Many had already entered, dozens of teams from all different villages, some people he recognized, others he did not. He wasn't alone either, many teams were chilling outside the building, the anxiousness from them palpable. Disappointingly, the vast majority of the ones hesitating to enter were from the Leaf Village. Many had their eyes on him, eyeing him curiously, both because of his relaxed state and because he was alone no doubt. They probably thought he didn't notice their attention either, since he had his eyes closed, coolly, too bad for them, his eyes could see through his eyelids should he so desire. Well that, and because he just randomly spoke a second ago, some of them seemed freaked out by his statement. What are you doing? Isobu questioned, sounding lost, what do you mean, and so it begins. I'm setting the mood. Daiki replied, rolling his closed eyes. You know, you're incredibly pretentious sometimes. Isobu sighed. I know you think you're being cool and mysterious, but you're really not. To you maybe, Daiki gave an internal shrug, not an external just to be exact. See I've been thinking, but there's nothing saying this new variation of this world isn't being broadcasted in another world right now, and while it will probably still follow Naruto, other characters will get some spotlight, and I've already set my character path. Specifically, after Naruto's arc in Wave alongside Sasuke, where they really became true shinobi for the first time and saw how big the world really was, Daiki himself came barging in, crushed Sasuke, the main character's big rival, and was all epic, handsome, powerful, handsome, mysterious and handsome. He basically cemented himself as that badass guy that the main character and his rival strove to surpass. The type of guy that got his own side series or show that ran parallel to the main one and was generally liked even more. You're an idiot, you've put far too much thought into this and you said handsome three times, I so be deadpanned. But you haven't said I'm wrong, Daiki smugly pointed out, and he was just that handsome. It is highly unlikely, but not impossible as your own situation proves, I so be replied, heaving a sigh, you have been much more full of yourself the last few days, ever since you rutted with that Jonin, the Biju pointed out. Daiki's only response, was a smirk, he had not at all expected to lose his virginity a few days ago, and he definitely hadn't imagined Kuranai Yuhi would be the first woman he ever had sex with. Well, he said sex, but honestly they just fucked like animals, no lovemaking involved. To be fair, she came around acting all haughty and arrogant, thinking she had the right to test him when as far as he knew nobody else was getting tested, and in the grand scheme of things, she was utter fodder, her only redeeming trait being her body really. Honestly, he remembered her being quite bitchy in the original timeline as well, looking down on Naruto and the like, and he'd never really been a big fan of her. Then she put herself up as the prize and well, the rest was history. Who knew Kuranai was actually a huge slut, and a size queen at that. She couldn't control herself at all when he, summoned, his mighty, serpent king Manda. Sage mode, when she stripped down and wiggled that sweet ass of hers at him. Honestly, it was an amazing night. Not only had he got to have his way with a beautiful older woman, he got the chance to experiment with her body, grind out his skills as a lover and in the process, discovered something amazing. Something he'd been hesitant to experiment with before until doing it on instinct with Kuranai. Manipulating the nerve system with lightning chakra. He managed to figure out how to trigger pleasure in the nerves through his lightning chakra with her. He touched upon one of the main techniques he wanted to master above all others with her. Now, he just needed to go down the path of learning to manipulate his nerve system with it, to heighten his overall speed, reaction time and reflexes. He was so glad he hadn't totally lost himself in lust for a sweet round ass, fat pair of tits and lovely voice squealing beneath him and remembered the path of the grind. His timetable had moved forward so much faster thanks to it.
Of course, it wasn't the only thing he'd worked on in the last week leading up to these exams after his night with Kuranai. Thank fuck for shadow clones to be honest. With most of his house decorating done, he'd been able to assign some of his clones to studying his new chakra armor. Specifically because, they were created through the fusion of chakra ore and fuenjutsu. The seal used in its creation for absorbing ninjutsu, was very reminiscent of the one within the infinite armor on his shoulder except it automatically converted chakra absorbed into usable chakra for the wearer and added to their chakra coils. Beyond that though, there was something in it he was very, very happy to get. A seal that created a barrier ninjutsu, a powerful one at that, that could ward off his strongest physical punches multiple times without wavering, it had taken over a hundred rapid fire blows at his strongest just to make it tremor. The only real weakness the armor had at all, was a resonance with the other armors that weakened it and made it unstable. Interestingly though, while most of the armor seemed to be of chakra ore with no elemental affinity, the blue trim on the ebony black armor, was different. It was lined with a lot of both wind chakra ore and water chakra ore, in a perfectly symmetrical and balanced amount. Which when used together, seemed to generate what Daiki was sure, was ice type chakra. Though considering how much was used in it, not something I can replicate anytime soon, he huffed. Seriously, there was a stupid amount of just water and wind chakra ore, probably a good 30 to 50 million ryo worth at least. He'd give one thing to Dodo at the very least, the guy went all out on his, or rather, Daiki's armor. To the point where Daiki, just from remembering the hand seals and having learned the water style, water dragon jutsu thanks to Isobu, was able to replicate the mod's own technique. Granted, the armor did all the heavy lifting for him, but it was still cool to be able to use even one ice-style jutsu. Honestly, I'm looking pretty damn awesome these days, Daiki admitted to himself proudly. He opened his eyes, his status screen appearing before his vision. Name. Daiki Yurei. Age. 13. Chakra Capacity. 87,000 87,000. Elite Jonin. Strength. 172. Endurance. 245, durability, 172. Agility, 172, taijutsu, 203 five hundreds, ninjutsu, 265 hundreds. Genjutsu, 45 five hundreds, bukajutsu, 116 five hundreds, chakra control, 222 five hundreds. Chakra affinities, lightning, advanced, roar with the power of thunder. Water, advanced. The sea parts before you. Fuenjutsu, advanced, the breath hitches. God just looking at his status screen made him want to punch his fist into the air and crow loudly about his sheer badassery. His lightning affinity had advanced when he made his little discovery with Kuranai, and his water affinity had caught up quickly thanks to the knowledge Isobu passed on to him from Yagura and all his water jutsu. He managed to finally get the last and most difficult of them all done just the other day thanks to his clones. His chakra capacity was getting more and more monstrous by the day, and that wasn't even getting into his physical stats or his taijutsu and ninjutsu. Not to mention, his fuenjutsu had risen up a stage as well now that he had learned everything there was to know about the seals used in the creation of the infinite armor and the chakra armor and he had so, so many ideas dancing in his head. Sure, with the time using shadow clones included, he'd probably actually been training for what amounted to two or so years, possible more in total, but hey. Am I a badass or what? Daiki mentally preened as dismissed his status screen. He wasn't even going to acknowledge the stupid add-on descriptions to his fuenjutsu and elemental affinities. He wouldn't give whatever it was, his subconscious or otherwise the satisfaction. You're going to end up missing the exams if you don't hurry up and get a move on Mr. Badass. Isobu prompted dryly. Oh right. Daiki blinked, foregoing his mental masturbation and pushing himself up off the tree. It was already around half three in the afternoon now and the exam started at four. With a confident swagger in his steps, Daiki made his way into the academy and towards the top floor where room 301 was located. Sasuke did his best to block out the general noise of those around him. It was hard, really hard. Sakura and Naruto were usually hard enough to tune out, but he'd gotten used to them, but of course he couldn't be so lucky to be only dealing with them when he was busy thinking. No, he also had the loud bragging of Inazuka to deal with, and Yamanaka harping on and arguing with Sakura about whatever nonsense they made up about him. So far, these Chunin exams weren't going well for him, 
especially since he'd already been knocked flat on his ass before even reaching the first testing room. Rock Lee huh? Sasuke frowned, doing his best to tune out his peers as they talked to the older bespectacled guy who was warning them not to make a ruckus and get the eyes of the other mass amount of genin in the room. Apparently some of them were mad or whatever about rookies, like himself and his peers getting in on the exam. No, his mind was entirely on just a few standouts, that guy, he's as fast as Daiki. He thought, he wasn't too fussed about having lost really, the guy was a complete weirdo, but he was the real deal, Sakura as usual hadn't noticed at all, but he had, as had Naruto surprisingly. But then, Naruto had some depth to him that most didn't even realize, simply too spoiled in Sakura's case or ignorant in others to realize the blonde wasn't as weak as his old grades would imply. The brutal scarring over his hands that showed just how hard Rock Lee trained himself, and just how much harder Sasuke would have to train himself. Naruto, Rock Lee, Gara, Daiki. Sasuke's thoughts trailed off as a smirk appeared on his face, ducking slightly so nobody caught sight of it. These exams were going to be exciting, a perfect place to grow stronger and test himself. And if he had his way, he'd see Daiki in the finals. A thought occurred to the Uchiha, as Kabuto explained about his ninja info cards, showing off a graph of how many people were taking the exams and from what villages and countries, over 150. Hey, Sasuke spoke up, eyeing the older gray-haired teen, do you have information on specific individuals? He asked. Oh, Kabuto gave him an interested look, have some people you're worried about? The apparent information specialist pushed up his glasses, well, of course my information isn't completely perfect, but I do have it. I even have quite a bit of information on you rookies. Sasuke grunted in understanding, ignoring the looks the rest of his graduation batch were giving him. What have you got for Gara of the Sand, Rock Lee and Daiki Yure? He asked. You know their names already, well, easy enough. Wish you'd make it a challenge though so I can show off a bit. Kabuto pouted at him, shuffling his cards. Sasuke rolled his eyes, always a show and dance with these people, just show me. Alright, alright here we go. Kabuto waved him off with a smile, and looked down at his cards. First we have Rock Lee, he's a year or so older than you guys, graduated with the batch before you. He's completed 20 d rank missions and 12 c rank missions. His sensei is Guy. His taijutsu has improved greatly over the past year, but nothing else of note. This is his first chunin exams and his teammates are Neji Hayuga the rookie of the year of the last batch and Tenten, the kunoichi of the year for the same batch. Barely anything of note. Sasuke mused, the most interesting being his teammates really. The busty Hayuga girl, Hibaba or whatever stilled at the mention of the other Hayuga, but said nothing, keeping a placid smile on her face. Whatever. He rolled his eyes and focused on Kabuto again. Next is Gara. he's a real newcomer, I have very little on him I'm afraid. He's completed 8 C rank missions and wow, A B rank as well. Pretty impressive for a genin. Interestingly, it seems he's come back from each mission without a scratch. That, Sasuke could believe, something about that guy wigged him out. And his stealth ability was on par with Kakashi's the guy had been in the same tree as the Uchiha without him ever noticing. Finally, we have Daiki Yure, Kabuto began, before trailing off and blinking, oh, oh wow. What? Sasuke arched an eyebrow at him. That was quite the reaction. Just, this guy is really impressive, Kabuto gave him a shaky smile and his eyes told Sasuke the older teen couldn't believe what he's saying, all right, Daiki Yure, graduated in the same batch as you, ranked overall 6th in class. Cited as being the most talented of your class by far according to an Uruka sensei, only ranked as low as he is because of lacking a specific focus for the shinobi arts and instead pursued every single one, there's a mention that should he have had a specific focus on even just two of the shinobi arts, he'd have been far stronger than even you Sasuke-kun when you all graduated. Seems about right. Sasuke agreed. Daiki was an utter monster when it came to training, the fact he ranked so high while pursuing every option showed how talented and hardworking he was. What, Daiki? Yamanaka scoffed, the cute muscle guy, he was alright, but no way he's better than Sasuke-kun, he's the best. She showed once again how much of an ignorant bimbo she was. Thankfully, Sakura didn't join her this time, though, he noticed how she tensed as if wanting to jump to his defense. Annoying, he wasn't so pathetic he needed someone to lie to him or about him. Daiki was stronger than him, far stronger than him now most likely since he became one of those Jinchiriki he told him about. 
After all, if it was a power that Itachi wanted, it was no doubt great and fearsome, especially considering according to Daiki, this specific biju that he sealed inside himself drove Itachi off before, making his brother flee for his life, albeit at great cost, but still, the fact Itachi had backup and still ran, was a testament to the might of the three-tailed biju, the sanbi as Daiki called it. Hey, I'm just reading what's been put down, take your complaints up with this Aruka sensei Kabuto shrugged off Yamanaka's complaints, but he had everyone's attention now, especially since he was talking of one of their classmates, right anyway. Moving on, Daiki has completed, wow, holy wow, he's completed 69 D-rank missions, 3 C-rank missions, 1 B-rank mission and to top it off an honest to god S rank mission. This guy's stats are off the chart, ninjutsu of possibly every element, powerful genjutsu, taijutsu that even Jonin would fear to face and rumor has it. He's killed multiple Jonin, one even said to be a member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. And to top it all off, this guy is taking this exam as well, and without a team at that. Looks like he's our ringer this year. Sasuke resisted the urge to click his tongue. Again, information that wasn't very helpful at all. He already knew all that, even the fact Daiki didn't have a team with him for the exams, he was pretty forthcoming about it. Holy crap. Inazuka gaped though at the revealed information and he saw Nara visibly swallow. Seemed they were at least smart enough to catch on that the information was accurate. Though again, nothing he didn't already know, in fact he already knew far more. Annoying, but he could deal with it. Wait, what's a ringer? Sakura piped in. Just that, a ringer in the corner, Kabuto shrugged. Most big villages when it comes to exams tend to send in at least one team that can show off and make their village look especially powerful and draw in more clients. Daiki San seems to be our ringer this year, and considering he's being given the chance to take an exam as dangerous as this alone, it says a lot about how much faith the higher-ups have in his abilities. Some of the others seem to be quite odd to hear about Daiki's apparent skill. Good, Sasuke was glad. It would make things ever more so satisfying when he beat Daiki himself and showed his power. If he could overcome Daiki after all, he would be one massive step forward towards his goal of avenging his clan. Well, don't get too wound up, Daiki-san is impressive for sure. But leaf, sand, stone, cloud, mist, rain, grass, sound and more have all sent exceptionally talented gen in here for the chance to show off their skills and get promoted. Kabuto laughed lightly before pausing. Well maybe not the hidden sound, they're quite a new and very small village after all. But the rest of the hidden villages are filled to the brim with bright and amazing young talents like yourself. You shouldn't underestimate any of them it could get you killed. Hearing that could make you lose confidence. Hibaba noted quietly. Good, Daiki had apparently done wonders for her confidence since she could even speak now in public, but she was thankfully still quiet. As a woman should be really, the complete opposite of Sakura and Yamanaka in that respect. Yeah, Sakura grimaced in agreement with the Hayuga girl, so basically, everyone here is. Kabuto nodded, just like Rock Lee, Gara, and Daiki. Everyone here is a top tier elite from their village, he confirmed. HMPH, I doubt it. Sasuke crossed his arms and rolled his eyes. Sure, there were going to be outliers, but most of them probably weren't even close to the likes of Lee, Gara, and Daiki. Hey Naruto, don't get so, at Sakura's voice. Sasuke looked over in interest to see her with her hand on Naruto's shoulder, the blonde's head dipped down. For all intents and purposes, he looked dejected. He wasn't though. Sasuke knew the blonde idiot well enough to know what was about to. Ha! Huh? Naruto threw his head back and laughed, a wild grin appearing on his face, sharp canines glinting under the ceiling lights. You all better listen here, the name is Naruto Uzumaki and don't you forget it. I won't lose to any of you bastards. Not even you Daiki wherever the hell you're hiding. Hey. Sasuke huffed in amusement as over a hundred pairs of eyes shot towards his blonde teammate, glaring bloody daggers at his boasting. W what the hell is that idiot doing Sakura? Yamanaka spluttered, pointing at Naruto, and the rest of the batch made comments of their own. Sasuke ignored them, instead, his eyes drifting around the room. He found Rock Lee sitting with his teammates halfway into the class and Gara with his own teammates leaning against the wall at the window. But where was, there he is. Sasuke's gaze landed on his target. Daiki wasn't paying attention to anything or anyone, or so he made it seem. The boy was sitting at the end of one of the long desks, arms crossed behind his head, eyes closed and his feet atop the table, 
looking for all intents and purposes to be completely relaxed. Interestingly, Daiki's attire had changed. It showed just how serious he was taking this. Before, he tended to wear slacks and simple t-shirts, but now, he was adorned in full-on shinobi gear, his ankles bandaged to keep the standard blue shinobi pants he was wearing from catching on anything, while atop his torso, he wore a shiny ebony black chest plate trimmed with dark blue, the weird turtle pauldron that he knew absorbed chakra from training with him, clear in view. As if sensing his gaze, one of Daiki's newly crimson red eyes opened and met Sasuke's own, before smirking his way challengingly. On instinct, his Sharingan flared to life, two Tomo now in each eye and he smirked right back. This was going to be fun, you know, it was funny. The more things change, the more they stay the same, Daiki snorted lightly, looking away from the little staring contest he was having with Sasuke. Kabuto had approached the nine rookie genin once again and things played out as they had in the other timeline, for the most part. It seemed he was getting more attention than Gara this time around though, and not just from his former classmates. Many of the other examinees now had their eyes on him. He ignored them. In his peripherals, movement through the crowd caught his attention, even as his former classmates began berating Naruto for bellowing his challenge loudly and proudly. The mummy-faced sound ninja was creeping through the crowd readying himself to make his move. D don't mind him everyone, haha, <laughs> Sakura gave a blatantly fake laugh, her arms wrapping around Naruto's neck and dragging him back, he's just an idiot, don't mind him, she tried placating. That idiot he just painted an even bigger target on us because of his loud mouth, Shikamaru grumbled lowly. Despite the distance between them and the Nara mumbling quietly, Daiki heard him clearly, the Shinkugan was useful like that. Honestly, Daiki had to resist the urge to roll his eyes. He never got the hype around the guy and he never understood why he was promoted. He became a chunin on merit of his ability to plan and strategize, not because of his strength. If Naruto and Sasuke and such didn't get promoted, he shouldn't have. Sure, he was better at planning, but the guy didn't have the strength to be a chunin. What was he gonna do the second someone strong came along, stall and then die? That was the best Shikamaru at the chunin exams could do to be honest. He was pretty mediocre at everything bar his strategic abilities and didn't even have a single attacking jutsu currently. Strength and mental ability should be required for a chunin, not just mental ability. Just then, the sound nin made his move, dashing out of the crowd of onlookers towards Kabuto and swinging out his gauntlet-clad arm. He could have stopped all that easily, but why should he? Besides, Daiki was going to make use of the confusion. While everyone's attention was drawn to the racket Dosu made by attacking Kabuto, while the older, Genin fell to his knees, his glasses cracking and vomiting even after dodging, Daiki's eyes swept over to one specific team. A team from Grass. His eyes landed on a tall willowy pale female dressed in yellow with a kasa hat hiding her face. He focused chakra into his eyes and peered deep into her. He frowned. Normal. He noted. There was nothing under her skin that said her appearance was being used as a disguise and her chakra network wasn't all that impressive either. A standard genin amount really, not much different from the rank and file spread throughout the room. Ha! Huh. Put this down on your little cards loser, the team from the Hidden Sound Village. Definite tune in at the end of this. Dosu boasted loudly to everyone in the room. He's not made the switch then. Daiki realized, filtering out the words of the sound genin. He'd specifically waited for this moment for Orochimaru to be distracted and have less chance of noting Daiki's attention on him. But in the end, it wasn't even Orochimaru at all, yet. Lame, I could have had fun with the sound idiots and showed off a bit, Daiki grumbled inwardly. Stupid snake man. Orochimaru probably wouldn't make the switch until just before the second exam. Considering the distance between here at the academy and training ground 44, there was quite an ample amount of time and opportunity to do so. Annoying, but, well he just had to deal with it. And it wasn't like he could have any fun now, because. Poof. At the front of the massive classroom, a huge puff of smoke appeared, drifting away in just mere moments to reveal dozens of shinobi and kunoichi clad in grey uniforms. At the front of the group, a tall, broad-shouldered and hard-faced man with a long black leather trench coat. Quiet down you worthless maggots. Ibiki Morino bellowed, his deep voice, like rocks grating together almost shushing everyone immediately, Oi, you sound punks, watch your step, don't go doing as you please before the exams even begin. I apologize we just got a B, Dosu never got to finish before Ibiki snorted, shut it maggot, 
He spat, cutting the mummy-faced teen off, and looking around. All right, fools. My name is Ibiki Morino, and I'll be the proctor for your first exam. His eyes landed on the rookie Jenin for a moment, before moving on and nodding as he saw that he apparently had everyone's attention. Let me make one thing clear you little pigs, there will be no unauthorized fighting or killing here. Any of you that disobey me and my rules, will automatically be failed, got it? He bellowed. Daiki had to bite his lip when he saw a few people actually snap to attention as if he was some kind of drill sergeant. Right, now get your asses lined up, Abuki nodded and ordered reaching into his pocket and pulling out a bag. You won't be getting to choose your seats. In this bag, there are numbered tiles. Get up here and grab one. Whatever number is on there, will be your seating arrangement, now move it. Daiki didn't make a fuss, though quite a few people grumbled as they lined up in single file to grab the seating arrangement tiles from Ibiki. None more so than Naruto. He was a few places in front of Daiki and whispering to himself, but he could hear him clearly if he focused and gaze on the blonde boy. He was freaking out about it being a written exam, poor fucker. The line progressed and a minute later at most, Naruto got his seating arrangement and turned around, steps wooden. Daiki grabbed him by the shoulder before the blonde could make his way past him. Daiki? Naruto blinked, so you're here? Not the time bro, Daiki shrugged and leaned over so his lips were right next to the blonde's ear. Don't worry about filling in the questions, it's not about that. Just cheat, steal the answers from others. What? Naruto squinted at him in confusion. Daiki just shrugged and let him go, stepping past him as the line continued forward and letting the blonde go. Ibiki raised a hairless brow at Daiki when he stepped up, eyeing him with interest. Did he hear me? Daiki wondered, before shrugging internally and moving on. It didn't matter in the end, he was just making sure Naruto didn't punk out or something since he wouldn't be with the same old same old Hinata from the original timeline. It wasn't like he was incapable of it either, the guy could create shadow clones, switch with them and transform on the fly without anyone even noticing. Moments later, Daiki returned to the same exact seat he'd been chilling at waiting for the exams to start, seat number 69. It was his special number after all, the Shinkugan was ever so useful. He found himself sitting next to a very interesting person though, an older boy, with pajama-like attire and purple face paint. Sabaku no Konkuro, or Konkuro of the Desert, one of the three children of the case cage. He would have much preferred his older sister. Sup? Daiki greeted him, collapsing into his seat and kicking his feet up on the desk casually once more. Konkuro looked at him, then looked away, ignoring him, utterly dismissing him even and looking over the test sheet in front of him. Ouch, rude. Well, whatever. Daiki placed his own test sheet on the table, face down. Then he activated his Shinkugan to see through the paper itself and began trying to read the letters of the questions backwards. As long as he was waiting here for the exam to start, he may as well get some form of grind in. Never know when some crazy pants is gonna trap me in a crazy genjutsu that will warp my sense of direction or something after all, he mused. Hmm, actually, he should plan for that ever happening. Itachi could probably do that to him. He didn't plan on getting Kurenite anytime soon, ever actually. Seriously, Kuranai was a bit of a joke amongst fans for trying to genjutsu Itachi. And in this rendition, she got dabbed on and plowed all night long by a genin, moaning submissively beneath him. She really wasn't all that impressive at all beyond her body and overall looks. Not long later, once everyone was seated Ibiki went on to explain the rules of the exam. Daiki only listened with a half ear, especially because most of the exam rules here, didn't affect him as much since he was going solo right now. He didn't need to worry about anyone's points but his own. Still, he could feel a palpable tension in the air. Ibiki could really set the mood and knew how to set a tense atmosphere. Half these guys were ready to piss themselves. Daiki should learn from his example. Though he'd need to convert that scary aura of his into one of sheer badassery. On instinct, Daiki tilted his head, a kanai whizzing right past him and stabbing into the desk behind him. 76, you're out, Ibiki declared. Already, Daiki blinked. It had been less than three minutes. He could feel a number of eyes on him due to his relaxed position, but he ignored them, idly looking at his test questions. Number one was a cryptogram, number two was a problem-solving question involving a shuriken, a target of seven meters in a tree and in what ways one could use the shuriken to take them out. To be perfectly honest, going through questions from one to nine, he figured he could only answer about four of them reliably on his own. 
How should I cheat? He mused, placing his pencil on the bridge of his nose and balancing it. He could easily just check out one of the planted chunin pretending to be Jenin and copy their answer sheet. Or he could even just copy Sakura. Easy as pie. But the whole reason he was even in this exam was to show off. So he needed to stand out not only to the examiners, but to everyone else as well. Simple and straightforward then, that'll do it. Daiki grinned lightly, looking around with his eyes and finding anyone near him with a completed test sheet already. There, one just a few rows in front of him. Pulling his feet from the desk, Daiki stood up from his seat and walked his way down to the Chunin plant. Dozens of eyes went to him. He stopped beside the Chunin. He noted the man blinking and turning to look at him in confusion, his mouth oh. Daiki's fist caught him square in the face, slammed his face against the desk hard enough to smash his face through the wood. He was unconscious before he even knew what was going on. And Daiki grabbed his test sheet and walked back to his own seat, while everyone watching gaped at him. Number 69, that's two points, Ibiki warned him. And he still had eight left. Sitting down, he scribbled out the Chunin's name and wrote his own, then kicked his feet back up and closed his eyes and began relaxing again. Alright new rule maggots, anyone pulling the same as this guy gets automatically disqualified, Ibiki amended the rules a moment later before anyone else could copy him. Hey! Underscore, within the observation room overseeing the first exam, silence prevailed. Despite the fact there was a variety of John in multiple villages, none made a sound for a good few seconds. Only broken by a light snort. From Kakashi. So this is Daiki Yurei, huh? Asuma spoke up with the silence broke, observing the screen showing off room 301. Yeah, that's him. Kakashi confirmed with a nod. The kid is bold as all hell. The son of the third Hokage shook his head, and look how relaxed he is. He doesn't care at all that he's got everyone's attention now. Which is kind of the point, Kakashi shrugged, Hokage-sama put him in to attract attention, he's just following orders really. I get that, but still, Asuma shook his head and chuckled, kid has to have a massive set of balls on him, was he like that with you when you tested him Kuranai? He looked to his side and asked. Indeed, he was. Kuranai confirmed. She resisted the urge to sigh, she was doing her best to ignore the boy and focus on her own team. But, she could well confirm that he did have a set of, massive balls. A set of balls she was intimately familiar with by this point. Seeing as the boy had forced her to slobber all over them in worship on her knees while he had a hand fisted into her hair. Multiple times. She'd been forced to seek him out again after the first night, because she'd completely forgotten to give him his Chunin exam entrance papers with how. Distracted she'd been with what went down. Which reinforced for the rules of his house in respect to her, and promptly found herself on her knees submissively worshipping his huge cock and satiating the teen's lusts once again. She barely suppressed a shiver and did her best to ignore the heat pooling in her belly. There was no love or affection between them. Just pure animalistic lustful fucking that left her sore, absolutely exhausted and completely satiated. Man I really hope my kids don't end up facing him, Asuma cringed, he'll tear them apart. Probably, though he might go easy on the Yamanaka girl, Kakashi shrugged and pointed out, He's a bit of a sucker for a pretty face, went right out of his way to help that little Hayuga girl and didn't really want anything out of her in return. He won't go easy on her at all even if she is a pretty girl. Kuranai resisted the urge to snort. He didn't go easy on her at all. In fact he quite enjoyed going as rough as possible with her and loved spanking her ass and seeing how fast and wildly he could make her big slutty tits bounce, in his own words. And she knew for a fact while he didn't pursue anything sexual with Hinata like he did her. He wasn't gentle with her either according to Hinata when they sparred and had broken her bones multiple times, mostly her fingers. Many of the foreign Jonin paid special attention to their words, fishing for information on the boy, it was a testament to his ability that he had them wary without them ever seeing him fight with his little performance. Grass, stone, cloud, mist, even the Jonin from sound was listening in quite blatantly. Even with his eyes closed and not using his ocular abilities, Daiki could literally feel the gazes on him after he pulled his little punch and snatch. Even Konkuro at his side was outright gaping at him for a few seconds before buckling down and getting back to his own test. It took him a few more minutes into the test to realize something though, I need to wait a full hour for this to end, he grimaced. A total waste of time. That was time he could be using for training. Sure, there were quite a few people around that he knew as well, but he couldn't exactly talk to them to pass the time seeing as it was an exam after all and no talking was allowed between people. 
Why did he think taking these exams instead of just accepting his promotion was a good thing? Resisting the urge to sigh, Daiki channeled chakra through his eyes and peered through his eyelids, idly letting his head loll back and forth as if bopping to a tune only he could hear. He was really just taking the time to examine everyone and see what they were up to. As it turned out, not a lot. Neji and Hinata he could see easily, had their Byakugan activated and were already copying answers down from someone else. Possibly even from him. Sasuke had his Sharingan activated and it looked like he was copying the movements of a guy a few tables down from him. Gara was using his sand eye, which was interesting, but nothing Daiki could replicate himself. Honestly, the most interesting was probably Tenten. She'd somehow got a mirror onto the roof without anyone noticing and was manipulating it with ninja wire. Hiding the wire in the flashes of light coming from the ceiling light bulbs above. Not only was she getting the answers for herself, she was manipulating the mirror for Lee to see up into as well. Lee was lucky Tenten was on his team, or he'd be up Shig Creek without a paddle like Naruto I. Just then, four small rock walls rose up around the area where Naruto was at, blocking him and the two beside him from view. It caused quite the commotion, and two of the Chunin proctors quickly smashed the walls apart, only to reveal Naruto, a massive grin on his face, and the two guys beside him, both unconscious. Daiki only managed to catch sight of two wisps of smoke and just barely thanks to his eyes behind the two unconscious examinees. And with no proof Naruto did it, they couldn't deduct points from him either. Huh, was that the earth style? Barrier jutsu I showed Sasuke? Daiki blinked. So Sasuke actually did teach it to Naruto. How the hell did he make four walls at once? He wondered for a moment. Shadow clones maybe? It was definitely shadow clones that knocked the two beside him out at the very least. Interesting, Naruto actually got the answers on his own merit because of a jutsu he'd shown Sasuke and offhandedly mentioned teaching to Naruto. That was new, and something he'd need to keep his eye out for. Naruto went stupidly far with a limited amount of jutsu under his belt. He got exponentially more threatening for each single jutsu he gained and played with to make a stupid amount of variations with. Also Naruto just totally copied what he did. Visual learner indeed. It probably helped that Naruto actually had the balls to go through with something like that in the first place as well. Probably a good thing he did as well, since he wasn't beside Hinata this time around. Still, now it was back to boredom. He couldn't even just send messages to Fu and chat with her to pass the time either. While nobody else could get the message of the wave transmission jutsu if he attuned it to her chakra, they'd still be able to sense his chakra and he'd get pulled up for assumed cheating, maybe. There were others blatantly abusing Chakra, but Ibiki specifically had his eyes on Daiki, his eyes kept coming back to him and examining him. Why, he didn't know, probably to do with his blatant cheating and abusing of the rules, but either way he didn't want to push his luck, he didn't know if the guy was a sensor ninja or not. He was distracted for a moment, by his seatmate calling out that he needed to go to the bathroom, and one of the proctors who had been silent up till now, standing up from where he was sitting and agreeing to take him. Daiki's eyes sharpened behind his eyelids with interest. From Konkuro's fingers, thanks to his eyes, he could see strings of chakra traveling along to the chunin. Who was not a chunin at all, but rather a puppet in disguise. He already knew that of course, but his interest was piqued by the chakra strings themselves. So that's how you use them. Daiki mused, watching keenly how the other boy manipulated his chakra to create them. He was compressing his chakra at the tenketsu in his fingertips, making it a near tangible, physical thing. He could only see the strings thanked to his eyes, but now he had a very good idea on how they were created. Lowering one of his hands out of view, Daiki focused chakra at the tip of his index finger and decided to try and copy him. It took a few seconds, but compressing his chakra at the tenksu and forcing it out was quite easy. His training with chakra flow and creating elemental chakra made it a cinch actually. A thin strand of chakra extended out of his fingertip, and flopped around uselessly like a wet, slimy noodle dangling from a tree branch during a windy day. Well, he had the technique down at least, he just had to train with it to get proper control with it, that was all. He already had a good idea of how it worked by sticking to and controlling things as well, he assumed it was an application of the surface walking technique. Alright maggots, pencils down, Ibiki called out thunderously. Bang on the second the clock at the front of the classroom hit five. Turn your test papers over. It's time for the tenth question. A wide, malicious grin spread across his face and he looked all around the room, 
making sure everyone's attention was on him. Now, the tenth question has some special rules, very special rules, he said before pausing, letting a tense silence build up before continuing, simply speaking, you can choose to leave right now, but if you decide to stay and take the tenth question, if you get it wrong, you fail and so do your teammates. If you leave, your teammates have to go with you. It's all or nothing, especially since, if you fail the tenth question after deciding to stay, none of you will ever be allowed the chance to be promoted again. All around him, Daiki could see many lock up in shock, go wide-eyed and more, a variety of shocked and horrified expressions being directed at the man. You can't do that, someone near the front spluttered, voicing his complaints. Yeah, he's right, you're just a leaf ninja, you don't have the power, another agreed, and moments later, there was a chorus of shouting and agreement from others spread throughout the room. Silence maggots, Ibiki roared, killing intent flooding the room and shutting them up instantly. Daiki had to withhold a whistle, it was some pretty nasty killing intent the man had developed, though it didn't even come close to the mere presence Isobu gave off when he first met the biju, your little peanut brains might not understand, but I have all the power here. All your leaders agreed to this the second they sent you here, this is my exam, and if you talk back to me one more time, every person who opens their mouth gets automatically stamped in the face with a big fat F for failure. And they shut up real quick at that not a single one willing to open their mouths after that. The tension in the air was heavy as shit, Daiki could even see one Kunoichi trembling just in front of him. I'm sorry, she exclaimed, pushing up to her feet and looking around, presumably for her teammates, but I can't be stuck as a genin forever. Fail, Ibiki barked, now get out of here you trash. He jerked his thumb at the door, making the Kunoichi and her two teammates trudge out sullenly. They were not the only ones, bit by bit, over the period of a minute, more and more gave up and trudged out of the room like little bitches. Well, not many more will leave. After all, Naruto should be about to light a fire under their asses and get them motivated. More teams got up and left, the seconds ticked by. Naruto didn't speak up, in fact, a quick glance back at the blonde led Daiki see that the blonde was smirking smugly, arms crossed, completely immune to the oppressive atmosphere within the air. Naruto's not speaking up. Daiki's eyes went wide. Why? No wait, was it because of him? Naruto got all his answers this time around, thanks to the jutsu Sasuke got from Daiki himself and Daiki telling Naruto to cheat and working as an example for him to learn from. That meant, his eyes flickered to a few tables behind Naruto, where Sakura sat the cute pink-haired girl was trembling, face pale, her eyes locked onto the back of Naruto himself. He pushed chakra into his eyes and focused on her, always acting like a fool who only knows one thing, Hokage, Hokage you always go on about. I'm sorry Naruto, that impossible dream of yours that means so much to you, I don't want to see it crushed. Her thoughts echoed through to his mind and Daiki grimaced. Both Sasuke and Naruto were in front of her, so they couldn't see her either. She was totally dead set on giving up, though not for herself, or even Sasuke, but for Naruto, to protect his dream. His respect for the girl went up a notch. She was looking like a real 4 out of 10 now. But if he didn't do something, she was going to get them all disqualified. For a moment, the thought went through too. To let her, if they weren't in the examines, Orochimaru couldn't mark Sasuke. Only then he realized that nothing stopped him from just following Sasuke to his house and doing it then. He was already in the village. And if they didn't go through with this, they wouldn't get the training they did in the month leading up to the final round. They'd be vastly weaker. Daiki himself would probably have to deal with Gara. If that happened, there was literally nothing he could do to help out proper during the crush to avoid the Sandame dying. Not unless he full on wanted to reveal everything in his hat and go full Isobu Biju mode and wreck shit. And even then, it would make Naruto and Sasuke weaker overall for later, when shit really hit the fan. Fucking hell, such a little thing could cause so many damn ripples. Daiki ground his teeth for a moment, before sighing and deciding to intervene himself. He placed his hand down out of view and concentrated, a rippling wave of chakra leaving his palm and spreading back through the room just as Sakura's arm began to raise. Calm down Sakura, it's a test, trust me, don't go giving up, you're better than that. He transmitted through the wave transmission jutsu. Sakura froze a split second later, eyes widening minutely before her head whipped from Naruto's back to look at him. She stared at him and he gave her a smirk, before winking and turning around. Daiki, you're speaking in my head? Sakura's inner thoughts reached him. 
It's a jutsu I picked up and costs a lot of chakra, so just listen okay? He transmitted. Are you sure? She fretted. Don't worry that nice and perky round ass of yours. Ibiki is talking shit. He doesn't have the power he's claiming he does. He's testing everyone's metal here. Basically, if you can't put your rank, a little thing like that on the line as a ninja, then you aren't qualified to be one, he told her. I see, wait, the hell do you mean perky round ass you pervert? She spluttered. His smirk grew and he glanced over his shoulder at her. Well, it's a nice ass and those spandex shorts you like to wear show it off pretty well. He transmitted once more, before cutting off his line to her thoughts. Her cheeks went as pink as her hair and those green eyes of hers glared at him. He turned back around and ignored her glare. Hey, worth it. Thankfully from there, things progressed much in the same way they had in the other timeline from what he remembered, Ibiki passing everyone who stuck around and explaining the point behind the tenth question, most getting riled up and pissed off, and then him taking off his bandana to show off his skull, wrought with scar tissue, burn marks and holes from outright screws being screwed into his head. It was a horrifying sight, much more horrifying in person and Daiki had to admit, the fact the man endured that kind of torture and escaped to come back in person, was worthy of admiration. Ibiki was a real badass for sure. Not as badass as Daiki himself, but a badass nonetheless. Actually, if he remembered right, it was Rokusho Ooi that tortured him like that before abandoning the village and joining the hidden rain. Daiki made a mental note to torture that traitorous fuckhead and go full on Toborama on his ass if he ever found him. Maybe shove the raging down his throat and electrocute him from the inside out while he was at it. He was broken from his thoughts by a speedy black blur smashing through the window, glass raining across the classroom. The black blur unraveled into a banner with white letters, while landing on her feet before it, was Enko Mitarashi, and damn what a body that lady had on her. The mesh under her open trench coat was a lot thicker than he thought it would be, so her skin underneath wasn't in full view, but it didn't hide any of her shape at all. He could easily make out every contour of her breasts despite the thickness of the mesh. And damn did she have some big titties, she even had Kurinai beaten out. You fools, this is no time to be celebrating, Anko barked. Eyes narrowed into a furious glare. My name is Anko Mitarashi, the proctor for the second exam, now follow me. Nobody moved, just staring at the woman that appeared out of nowhere and started making demands. Daiki mentally shrugged and stood up, time to get a move on. I could have sworn she said something about being sexy and single at some point, he thought. She was a lot more hardcore here it seemed. Or was he just actually remembering wrong? As he got up, others took it as their cue and copied him. Hey, Ibiki, the hell is this? Anko glared at the bald first proctor. There's a full damn 26 teams left. You going easy on them or something? Ibiki shrugged and gave a snort. We've got a few interesting ones this time around. He replied vaguely. Eyes meeting Daiki's for a moment before looking away. Enko followed his gaze and met Daiki's eyes as well, one eyebrow raising up. That's so. She grunted. How unladylike. Them tits though. 